Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. This is Senate Health and Welfare. It's September 10th. And we're uh, having a conversation. Initially, we're hearing from folks regarding the public safety mental health issue that we're familiar with, and then trying to understand what the recommendation and proposal is uh, currently. I know that there was a bill that went to the House, and I, I believe the House is working on that or has worked on it. And um, I think each person who is here with us today will have something to guide us and help us. Um, so we have uh, Mike Sherling, who is first. I'm looking at my agenda, excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Um, so unless, uh, unless there are any questions from the committee, why don't we just uh, start right in and um, commission, uh, secretary, is it commissioner? No, commissioner of public safety, uh, Sherling, why don't you begin and uh, share with us the information. I know you put quite a bit on our webpage, so that will be helpful. Yes, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and committee. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to weigh in on this. Um, literally could go on for an entire day on this topic, uh, but I only have 26 minutes before I'm scheduled to be in uh, Senate Judiciary. Um, <clears throat> this has been something that we have been uh, talking about and building capacity for in public safety, small p, small s, statewide for more than two decades. Um, it strikes me as this conversation has pivoted to where this funding and this type of a program should reside that we have uh, heretofore in this conversation uh, skipped over the underlying need. So I wanna go there first. Um, over the last decade or more, uh, we have seen call volumes in public safety. And by that, I mean to law enforcement, emergency medical services, the fire service, and by extension, uh, trips to emergency departments and then to correctional facilities that relate to underlying um, mental health crisis. And often important also tonight to note, it's often some kind of a co-occurring event. Um, it's not exclusively um, mental health. There could be substance abuse. There could be un other unmet social service needs. Um, and in many instances, it's not actually someone who's, uh, who's suffering from a, a, a DSM-4 diagnosis of some sort, but is, um, is altered in their perception of things and their behavior. Um, and it gets lumped in under uh, quote unquote mental health, but that's not, uh, that's not always exactly accurate. Um, those call volumes have increased exponentially over the years. The number one thing that I hear about as I travel the state and meet with public safety leaders pre-COVID, there's not as much traveling uh, over the last seven months. Uh, the number one concern is the impact of these kinds of calls for service on resources and an, uh, an inability to have the, the correct tool sets deployed at the time these crises are uh, evolving. Um, from the numbers I experienced when I was chief in Burlington, we saw a 400% increase uh, in mental health related calls uh, between 2008 and 2015 when I retired. Um, our systems in state government are not as uh, accurate uh, in terms of being able to track that, but anecdotally and based on some statistical information, uh, we believe those numbers are similar, uh, that there have been exponential increases. We have uh, experience with deploying uh, social workers and, and mental health outreach staff uh, in many different areas of the state, uh, directly partnered with public safety professionals at the time that the crisis is emerging, um, and all of that experience is positive. We, I have yet to hear of an instance where the, anything ranging from the embedded social worker in Bellows Falls to the two mental health outreach workers we have in barracks to the street outreach teams that are partnered directly with, uh, with law enforcement organizations in Chittenden County and others have had a negative experience. Um, if those experiences exist, I'm eager to hear about them. Um, 
because both the ass assessments of the positive impact of, of creating these partnerships uh, as evidenced by four different reports spanning uh, more than a decade. I think one of those reports dates back to 2009. There are some from 2011, uh, 10, 11, 12, and one from uh, state police experience and one of the barracks dated in 2020 are all positive. Uh, and positive in that they are reducing calls for service, they're improving outcomes, they're reducing correctional center visits, they're reducing hospitalizations. Um, and it, any way you look at this, uh, no matter which lens it's from in terms of the positive impact on the folks that are in crisis or uh, the, the uh, alleviation of the burdens and the expense on a host of different systems that often are ill-equipped uh, to deal with some of these issues, uh, the results are positive. The reality is that for a, a cross-section of the population that finds themselves in crisis for one reason or another, again, sometimes it's mental health, sometimes it's substance abuse, oftentimes it's co-occurring co events, the entry door is 911. It's a public safety answering point. It's not a crisis hotline. There are actually people out there who... Um, don't trust the mental health system. There are others that don't trust the law enforcement system. We have to have multiple ways for them to get access uh, to this kind of uh, assistance. We get calls from people who are asking specifically for um, particular police officers because they have developed a relationship there. We have folks that call and ask for specific mental health workers because they've uh, developed a relationship there. Um, so Again, a variety of uh, really compelling positive impacts that have, uh, have occurred over the years. I am, um, I would be disingenuous to say I'm anything but a little bit baffled by some of the pushback on this proposal um, and the specific uh, way in which we frame this to be a, an expanded partnership with first responders uh, and, and uh, and law enforcement, because the uh, experience has been so positive. And on a personal note, because for two decades, I've been in meetings with secretaries of human services, with commissioners of the Department of Mental Health, other commissioners and secretaries in prior administrations, asking, literally begging for resources to expand these programs. And um, a, a trickle of resources has been put forth. We are now in a position where we have um, put forth a plan to dramatically improve and expand on existing programs, and there's pushback now. And I'm, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't have any other way to describe it other than baffled um, at how that can be. Um, you've heard a variety of testimony. I've had an opportunity to read some notes, um, and without going point by point, uh, there's a variety of it that is inaccurate. I'll, I'll pick on one piece uh, from my friend Robert Appel who described that he has not seen de-escalation occur uh, in any instance where, uh, and I'm paraphrasing so I may ha not have this entirely accurate, um, uh, where uh, police officers have arrived at one of these scenes. I can tell you unequivocally and without hesitation that that's not accurate. Uh, that's not been my experience. Um, I have gone to literally thousands of calls for service myself, and I have supervised hundreds of thousands of calls for service uh, as a law enforcement executive. And I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of responses are met with compassion and de-escalation, um, oftentimes by police officers. And sometimes when we can deliver those services partnered with a mental health outreach uh, uh, specialist together. Um, just to give you the to 2019 statistics from just the state police, 115,000 calls for service. That translates into roughly a quarter million contacts. 183 of those resulted in some escalation that translated into a use of force beyond compliant handcuffing. Let me give you the numbers again. 183 out of over 115,000 responses and over a quarter of a million people interacted with. If that is not evidence of de-escalation, I don't know what is. Um, from a, a purely operational perspective um, and budget perspective, 
There are a number of challenges uh, concept of moving this over to the Department of Mental Health. First, uh, uh, from a budget perspective, uh, like any um, personnel funding, it's commingled into our budget in a way that makes it very difficult to extricate uh, everything from uh, vacancy savings and attrition for these positions to um, you know, host of other uh, ways that the way the hiring process flows and uh, things of that nature will create a shortfall in our budget if that but if that money is moved. Um, I know that's ancillary to this conversation, but you can expect that we will need some kind of a budget adjustment at the end of fiscal 21 if we extricate over a half million dollars and place it with another department. More importantly, um, operationally, the expansion of this program is an essential component of the modernization of the way we deliver safety services and a future shift in the way we modernize law enforcement in particular, but public safety more broadly. It's best suited to be an extension of the day-to-day -day emergency response uh, and the day-to-day -day outreach that's done out of uh, um, the, the public safety framework uh, and the public safety answering points. Removing this from that position will hamper the current efforts to uh, expand those services. It will hamper our efforts to modernize the way that we deliver services, which in an entirely other committee in, in 16 minutes, we're going to be talking about how we modernize the way we deliver safety services. There is a, uh, a nationwide call to do this differently. We know how to do it differently. We just need to resource it appropriately. Um, so again, a, a little baffling that we're having these um, conversations that appear to be going in two completely different directions at the same time. Um, as I mentioned, uh, among the most important things is that, that the primary entry point for literally thousands of people who are in crisis uh, on an annual basis is 911 and being able to deliver an array of services, including mental health response to those folks is an essential component of not only the future of how we deliver the services, but the way we do it now. This is already uh, a piece of the delivery models uh, in various places around the state. Um, and I would argue that those tools and resources are a more critical need at that point uh, in the process and in our overall crisis response than anywhere else in the system. That early response can prevent things from deteriorating to a more substantial crisis where force is used or outcomes are poor or a suicide occurs or a protracted hospitalization or incarceration has to occur. Um, so I, I can't overstress the importance of these resources being um, placed at exactly the right point uh, in the process. And that doesn't, that's not to say it's the only point. Crisis hotlines, peer support networks, and the array of services that the Department of Mental Health, the designated agencies and others deliver are critical components. What we're talking about is expanding a, a parallel critical component um, that, that the importance of can't be understated. I have uh, a Good. variety of additional notes, but mindful of the time, I think it may make sense to uh, to turn to the committee and the chair and ask if there are things that you'd like me to address, if there are concerns that you have uh, that I should speak to. You're muted, Senator. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, been very comprehensive. I think uh, we've heard the underlying tension between what public safety is doing and, um, and then additional resources to ensure that there is mental health and behavioral health capacity within uh, the various departments. Um, I, I, I would just add, Senator, I, I, I'm sure. not here to argue against the expansion of other mental health services. If you look at our, uh, in January, we put forth a modernization strategy for public safety, and this was a piece of it. And at the, the, the last page of that um, suite of proposals is an integrated public safety and public health construct where mm -hmm. prevention and education is at the base, outreach and intervention comes next, and then alternative sanctions, and then traditional courts corrections and uh, and things of that nature. And uh, it, it, we're not arguing against um, expanding those services. What I would suggest is we have to do both and don't short shrift this effort to move resources to something else that we also need investment in. 
So I think you're, you know, I think this is extremely logical and sensible what you're saying. The concern that we would have is to ensure that the criteria and the standards are in place uh, for any uh, mental health uh, individual or organization working within public safety that we don't all of a sudden see a bifurcation of systems. Uh, and in some ways, you know, I'm reminded of, and I'm not meaning to give a speech, but I think it is, uh, it is important of the health care that we see in corrections where there's a, the health care of corrections is, can be considered significantly different from the health care that we see out in the uh, rest of the, of the uh, state of Vermont. So my concern is doing it and doing it right. So it's important for us to hear from everyone about how that is and can happen. I, for one, and knowing what has gone on in my district, uh, including Burlington and then other municipalities, I am keenly aware of the effectiveness of the programs that you're talking about. So I think we all understand, um, I hope we all understand how effective uh, those programs have been. So, okay, uh, questions for Commissioner Shirley. I'm sorry to rant on, I didn't <laughs> mean to do that. Questions? Okay, um, we have uh, Commissioner Squirrel from uh, the Department of Mental Health and Commissioner, thank you for being with us. And Commissioner Shirling, I wanna assure you we get it, we understand. The, the question is, how do we do it right? Um, and I think you're asking the same question. Um, for us, we don't appropriate the funds, but we do ensure, provide some oversight for the, um, for the standards and the criteria and the people who are involved. So that's our I, goal. I would just so, say in, in parting, Senator, we're talking about replicating the success of existing programs as partnerships with the designated agencies to deliver the services, right. uh, with the folks delivering the services being employees of those designated agencies and healthcare providers. Um, and uh, uh, that's part of why this is uh, a little baffling to me is the programs oh, wow. are successful and we're simply looking to replicate them. And now we're hearing criticism of that. And I, I just don't understand where that's coming from. Well, you're not hearing the criticism from me. What you are hearing is how do we balance the management of that system? So, and I think that's that, I think that's what we're, we're hearing uh, right now. So we, we yeah, want to understand. And I, yeah. I will, I promise I'll stop talking, but I would submit we have achieved that balance. We know exactly how to deliver these services. And we've heard no complaints about the way in which they've been delivered um, with dozens of people that are delivering them to uh, today in a variety of different locations around the state. So I would just submit, if it's not broken, let's not tweak something that um, has been in, among the greatest successes in public safety. Uh, that I can point to in the last two decades. Anyway, I will stop talking. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, and thank you. And, I, and, and honestly, thank you for the work that you've done in this area because I know it's significant. Greatly appreciated. Senator McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Commissioner Sherling, I just wanna, uh, I, and I think I speak for the committee on this. I don't think any of us are necessarily arguing with you and, and saying, no, it's not working. But there are people who are saying that. And I think we are at least curious about the possibility that they might be right. And, and certainly there are instances, and maybe there, there, there are exceptions to the rule, but there have been instances where it, it, it seems pretty clear that the system didn't work right. So I wanna figure out you know, where, where, what the situation really is and where we need to go with it, which is not to say that I'm arguing that I hear very much with my personal experience, I'm a white man, has been very good with the police, you know, in, including at a recent protest demonstration where I was wondering, well, what are these police doing here? We're not breaking the law. I realized they were there, they really were there to protect us. There were guys with guns and that's who, they, who, the, who the police were hovering there. So I have nothing but good experiences with the police, but we're hearing reports that it doesn't always work out so great. And I, I think we're just, we have, we owe it to our constituents to look into it. So. I couldn't agree more, Senator, and that, that curiosity that you um, 
stated about wanting to know what might not be uh, working well, I have the same curiosity. Specific to these mental health delivery mechanisms, I don't know of any instances where things have not gone well where we're delivering this, these mental health outreach um, specialists. Um, so that's why we want to expand them is because the outcomes are better. That, so on this specific topic, I, if, if folks have, if anyone listening has instances <laughs> where this kind of a delivery mechanism has failed or has not um, achieved a better outcome, I am um, incredibly interested to hear that so that we can tweak what we're doing to uh, ensure that we're doing it the best way possible. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Senator, for your comments. Um, Commissioner Squirrel, welcome. And Deputy Commissioner Fox, welcome. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Nice to see everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair Lyons. Uh, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, and joined by Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox. Um, so I want to thank the committee um, for your time and intention. Um, to this important policy and programmatic effort on behalf of the state. I also want to thank Commissioner Sherling for his leadership on this and for his vision of modernization of public safety and to further expand the mental health outreach program statewide. I think this is a critical opportunity where we can really strengthen our collaboration between mental health and law enforcement. As Commissioner Sherling noted, a very high number of law enforcement calls are related to mental health and or substance use. And our goal is to ensure that we have an effective and therapeutic community-based response when that happens. Mm -hmm. Across Vermont, as Commissioner Sherling has highlighted, there's a continuum of collaboration that exists and we wanna to continue to build on that. That starts with, um, I think the team two training that many folks may be aware of uh, where we have comprehensive training between mental health and law enforcement. We have the mental health outreach programs um, that are happening um, at Northwest Counseling and Support Services and in Southern Vermont with HCRS. I know George Karagoakis is here. He can speak um, to the effect of that in his community. Um, and also the community outreach and street outreach programs that we've been able to stand up um, in Chittenden County. And I think that all of us across the state are eager to build on the success of those programs and to continue to expand them. And I would also note that nationally, this is an area of focus. Um, the American Psychological Association um, clearly recommends increasing mental health professionals working closely with law enforcement. Um, SAMHSA has clearly identified that crisis response partnerships with law enforcement are an essential principle for modern crisis care systems. And we think about our continuum of crisis care across the state of Vermont, that has been identified. Um, so DMH fully supports the expansion of the mental health outreach program through collaboration between the Department of Public Safety um, and our designated community mental health agencies. And the core elements of success that we wanna build on are continued inclusive collaboration, um, training and collaboration. Um, I would also just note that it's important to note um, that individuals with mental health challenges are not more likely than anyone else to commit crime. So I certainly want to make that very, very clear. And in fact, um, it's 10 times more likely that people with severe mental illness will be the victims of violent crime. Um, this is more about ensuring that uh, when an individual is in the community, that that first response is therapeutic and gets them connected to the right services and supports. Um, and if we really want to improve access to care, improve better safety for all, we absolutely have to continue to develop a close working relationship and partnership between law enforcement and our mental health systems. Um, so the mental health outreach program, uh, which is what is being proposed to be expanded across the state, you know, that model is really co-response teams. Um, that's really where it's a collaboration when designated mental health agency employees, clinicians, and social workers are working side by side with local law enforcement. It pairs the benefits of having embedded clinicians with community outreach. Um, and again, I think of it as this co-responder team out in the community. Um, and also, even as calls are coming in, um, law enforcement, clinicians, and dispatchers um, can really kind of triage and determine what kind of response 
um, might be best suited for the situation. Um, and that can look like mobile outreach and response, screening and assessment, de-escalation, referral to appropriate services, and follow-up. And as Commissioner Sherling has noted, you know, the outcomes have been very positive. Um, certainly within our system of care, we always have situations that happen in the community that don't go the way that we would like. Um, but all in all, the outcomes that we have related to the work that we've done around this have been powerful. I was just looking at some of the data um, from the relationship um, and collaboration between Northwest Counseling and Support Services and the Vermont State Police. And the data that they have, this program has been up and running, I believe for since 2017, um, that troopers are on the scene less than 30 minutes for 65% of the calls that have a mental health outreach worker responding to. So you're seeing a decrease in the amount of time that law enforcement is actually on the scene um, and the mental health clinicians are able to do that outreach. And 45% of those responses in the community um, actually resulted in referrals and additional outreach efforts. And from my perspective, that's a good thing. Um, those are things that we want to continue. I also think there are elements of trust building in communities that are essential. I think that this kind of collaboration can lead to kind of enhance that trust at the community level that also Commissioner Sherling spoke of. I also think that the embedded model has incredible value um, by having mental health clinicians working side by side um, in police barracks. We can kind of optimize um, the police culture. Um, how do we bring more trauma-informed approaches um, into the barracks? Um, it's very similar to other models that we have in the state. I think about our school-based mental health programs that we have statewide, where public schools are contracting um, with the designated agencies to bring mental health and social workers into their schools um, to support trauma-informed care for children. And the cultural impact of that on the schools in terms of having a more trauma-informed setting has been one of the greatest outcomes of that work as, all, of, of, as well. So I just think that those models um, are somewhat similar. I also wanna talk a little bit about implementation because I think this is one of the areas in Vermont um, where we're a small state, but sometimes we struggle to bring things to scale in a way that will actually result in the meaningful um, social impact that we wanna see. Um, so what this program does and what this proposal does is really take to scale um, something that we think is important that will have better outcomes for Vermonters um, and a better impact across the state. And like all things Vermont, we want to have a consistent systemic approach, but we also want to leave room for that regional innovation, community need, and that is exactly what I've seen in these programs, that it actually builds collaboration at the community level so that innovation can happen to ensure that the needs of community members are being met. As I've said before, I think trusting relationships and collaboration are at the heart of what has led to success for the implementation in other regions. Um, DMH, the Department of Public Safety, uh, will have an MOU that really articulates the, art, the collaboration, um, how the supervision works in terms of the designated community mental health agencies, and I think really leads to accountability and quality oversight over the long term. I would also note, as Commissioner Sherling did, that the clinical oversight of the clinicians is held solely um, by the designated community mental health agencies um, who will be supporting those clinicians um, in an ongoing way. Um, I also just want to note that I think it is very important, and I think this you know, kind of legislative policy process has brought in stakeholder voice um, and peers and individuals with lived experience. Um, it is important that we hear their voices and their voices inform the work as we go forward. And as Commissioner Sherling noted, the reality is that in our current system, um, when somebody in the community sees an individual experience a mental health crisis, they call 911. Um, so we want to ensure that the response that they get at the community level um, has a mental health clinician there. Um, that is going to lead to a better outcome. So expanding this program, I think is a significant step in the right direction. Um, I also just wanna note that I do think we need to take the time to ensure that those who are directly impacted have a voice as we move this important work forward. So part of our implementation plan, part of the MOU really does need to include how we include the voices of those with lived experience and how they can continue to inform and strengthen this work as we go forward. Um, I think the designated agencies are also well positioned to help us with that as they already have tables that are set 
um, for individuals to really provide input on these kinds of programs. I think when I think about this, it is a continuum. In the short term, we wanna strengthen and expand our mental health outreach programs. And midterm and long-term, as Commissioner Sherling noted, we really wanna think about our crisis continuum in the mental health system and continue to try to strengthen that. Um, and I think one of the key transformative elements of our future kind of crisis system and a recovery-oriented system of care is to ensure that we are in fully engaging peers in this work. Um, the experience, capability, and compassion of individuals who have experienced a mental health crisis um, needs to be front and center. I also think that the partnership can further best practices for addressing community and police relationships. In terms of the funding, um, I support the funding uh, flowing through the Department for Public Safety. I actually think from an implementation science perspective and my training and understanding, um, it really creates buy-in and engagement on behalf of our public safety partners, um, that they are bringing the funding forward. Um, they are committing to using our community mental health agency to provide the services. And I think that does help us um, create kind of a platform um, to advance us and continue to strengthen the collaboration between mental health and law enforcement. Um, so I'll stop there. I do wanna pause um, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox has been working for years on these efforts. Um, so I did want him to offer a few comments um, on some of his reflections on the work to date in Vermont. Thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Squirrel mentioned, uh, I've been doing a lot of work over the years uh, in my 25 year career in mental health uh, at the intersection of uh, uh, law enforcement and mental health, uh, having done a lot of work with Burlington Police in my early years as a uh, as a crisis clinician, uh, uh, working with Matt Young, uh, who originally started the uh, street outreach program there, uh, to being the court liaison um, in the in the uh, Costello Courthouse in Chittenden County, um, to working with the FBI and 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 other folks and law enforcement in many states. Um, and that's why I want, really kind of wanted to start with is, is around the many states. <clears throat> As has been mentioned uh, earlier, these types of models, uh, and there are many models, uh, as many words as I can say, there are probably just as many models uh, in uh, collaboration between mental health and law enforcement uh, throughout the country. Uh, mo most states throughout the country have varying models uh, with the collaboration between mental health and law enforcement, uh, ranging everything from actual police social workers who are a part of the police department and hired and, and are officers uh, to uh, embedded workers or co-located workers from, uh, from uh, community mental health centers to actual teams with specialists on, on teams that can re respond to domestic violence, uh, children's needs, homelessness, substance abuse, uh, et cetera. Um, there are many programs uh, that are uh, that are great models the, that we can uh, can learn from. But I also agree uh, with the statements of uh, Commissioner Sherling that we have good programs that are out there of various models already, um, and just trying to expand upon those uh, is a is a great goal. Um, you know, one of the programs in you know the state of Michigan uh, has uh, uh, has been well touted as uh, a great collaboration between mental health and and law enforcement. Uh, the uh, one of the local advocacy groups in Michigan, uh, known as the Michigan's Poor People's Campaign, uh, that works towards limiting systemic racism uh, and poverty, uh, is a tremendous supporter of the the programs in that state. Uh, a program in Minnesota. Uh, over the past two years reports a, a decrease of about 30% uh, of contacts with people who are frequently coming into contact uh, with law enforcement as a result of uh, uh, mental health or substance abuse needs. And by uh, enhancing their, uh, their collaboration with, with uh, mental health professionals have been able to work with those individuals and actually decrease the actual amount of contacts. As we all know, less contacts with law enforcement leads to less incarceration uh, and, and, uh, uh, and less uh, possible bad outcomes as well. Uh, 
uh, when you don't have any kind of contact, there's no need for a positive or negative outcome. When, when an individual is able to uh, receive the services they need to have the supports they need to be able to maintain safely in the community. Um, as has been mentioned locally, we have a lot of those programs here. Uh, many of them uh, uh, in working with the state police are, you know, become a, in a sense, part of a family. Uh, they become accepted uh, within the barracks. But one of the main things there is that you have this give and take of, of information. Uh, you have the, the positive influence uh, and impact on, on the culture uh, of the law enforcement agency and barracks uh, by bringing a mental health professional in uh, with them, um, as well as it creates a much better relationship between the entire agency of the, the mental health agency with the law enforcement agency. Uh, and we can only have better outcomes when we have better understanding and better collaboration. You know, better understanding and better collaboration do not lead to uh, negative outcomes. It, they can only lead to, to better outcomes. Uh, and so those are some really positive things that are happening. You know, the folks that, that work with, you know, out of barracks, they are receiving supervision, both individual and group, uh, by their, by their uh, crisis service directors, uh, remain a part of those teams, uh, and receive that, that kind of clinical support. Uh, and then just, just on one last piece, um, uh, the uh, Council uh, on Accreditation, uh, which is an international independent nonprofit accreditor of human and social service providers, uh, has kind of a list of <clears throat> several recommendations when setting up a planned connection with law enforcement and mental health professionals, two of which I want to just mention, which is uh, A, jointly evaluating policies and protocols to emergency response. And I want to speak to that just for one second. I think that, that that joint evaluation of policies and protocols to emergency response is not just the responsibility of the mental health providers and the law enforcement uh, providers, but also those with lived experience and those who are, how, who are on the receiving end uh, of, of how those policies and protocols get enacted and, and, and are used. The other is creating memorandums of understanding between the police departments and the providers to better define the roles and expectations around interventions. And that's exactly where we're considering and what we're proposing at this point is having those MOUs, <clears throat> excuse me, developed to ensure uh, that those roles are clear and that those expectations are clear. So, and due to due time, I, I wanna make sure we have time for other folks or questions, but I will leave it with that. Thank you. Um, thank you for all your work on this as well. I mean, it's amazing what you've done. Um, yeah, it's terrific. Uh, uh, both you and Commissioner Squirrel have been deeply engaged. Um, I, th I think what we will do, I have questions, but I'm going to hold those off until after we've heard from other folks, because I think that we may hear some comments uh, related to the MOU or other issues that you've touched on. So that would be helpful. Okay. So uh, we have, uh, is it Kareem or Karim? Kareem Chapman. It's Kareem Chapman, good morning. Good morning, welcome. Good it's morning. nice to have you here. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. So yes, uh, good morning to all. Uh, Kareem Chapman, Executive Director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Um, and on behalf of the peer world, I just wanna say thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, I just wanna briefly start with a, with a quick story. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I was on the way to see my dad in New York City. And when I got there, uh, he was shot and killed by police. Ooh. I was a very, very angry young man, um, stressed out, anxiety. The way I looked at the world was a, not a good one. I didn't understand at 14 years old why my dad um, was killed. And it was a mistaken identity at that. So at that point, I was very angry at law enforcement, at, at systems, at the world. Um, and it took one person, it took one person that came into my life that had some shared experience that understood and could relate to me of what I was going through. Until then, I was drugged. I was in facilities that the only solution was that, you know, we give medication to help your problem. Even therapists 
didn't understand how it was to be an African-American male um, that had just seen his father killed, uh, it was no solution. It was only medication. So this person with shit experience that really helped me through the situation. Any other than that, I could not see no, no other way out. I was a very angry, very violent young man, um, made a lot of bad choices, and I didn't understand what was happening to me. When this person came into my life and shared his story uh, and gave me the opportunity to understand that I'm not by myself, it made the world of difference. And I'm saying this story because the impact that the peer service world has on working with people with mental illnesses is a great one. I mean, the evidence is there. Uh, for two years, I've actually worked in a designated agency in Rutland, Vermont, um, where I created a peer program within a crisis team. And I worked along the side of clinicians and therapists, and it was a great relationship. I've, I've, I've built relationships with police, department, police officers that I respect and understand their position and role. And I wanna say this, nothing works if we don't have understanding. We cannot move forward if we don't understand everybody's role in the position, the law enforcement officer, the peer worker, the clinician, everybody has a role to play. And I think that if the peer voice is not at the table, we, are, we have a disconnect there. And process won't be valid or relevant if we're not at the table. Um, so, and, and also for the past two years, I've had only one person go back to the ER. When I'm sitting on people's couches or taking walks, and you know, we all know that there's a stigma of mental health and what the community looks at. You know, there's a fear there. And when people are in trouble or having a rough day, they really, their, for, their first choice is not to go and call a crisis person. You know, they want to either figure it out on their own or law enforcement gets involved. I've been on many calls where I've been a part of the escalating situations. Well, all the person wanted to do is just talk. And in 10, five, 10 minutes, it was de-escalated. And the officer didn't have to do too much. So again, I just want to really just reiterate and, and, uh, and give my testimony that the peer work is very impactful and we have to be at the table. Um, also, we educate in the community. I mean, I haven't heard anybody say yet how we're educating the community and getting the community involved. Um, I believe on knocking on doors. I believe in going places where most people won't go, those dark places where people are that we need to service and ask them what's happening, how can I help? I mean, it's great to talk about what we're gonna do, but what are some of the action steps that we're gonna put in place to really make these things happen? So, I mean, I'm here in front of you saying that I'm living proof, I'm a survivor. I am a peer person that knows that it can, it can work out. And we have to figure out together, not to fight about it, but how to figure it out. And there is, there is room and a way for everybody to play a role. And I'm gonna leave it with that at this point. And if there are any questions, I'm, uh, I'm willing to ask or to answer. But again, just, we, we gotta get this right because people are suffering um, and people need answers. And we are in a great position right now to make it happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for sharing your very compelling story. Um, I can't imagine going through that. And it's, it's really terrific to hear your voice uh, and your experience that has brought you to where you are today. So thank you. And thanks for your comment about having uh, peer support. Uh, I think we'll, yes. we, what we'll do is uh, let's keep moving on, and then we're going to open it up for questions and discussion uh, generally, because I think uh, I, I think that it's starting to coalesce around uh, the questions we need to ask. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Wilda White, Wilda, welcome back to committee. It's good to see you. Uh, and uh, why don't you introduce yourself and give us your testimony? Thank you, it's also nice to see you, all of you. My name is Wilda White. Um, I'm listed on the agenda as the chair of the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. I uh, chaired that commission during our review of the um, 
law enforcement killing of Phil Brennan. But today I'm not speaking to you as, a, um, as chair of the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. The commission has not taken a position on this proposal, but I also wear a number of other hats. Um, as many of you may know, I am the former executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. I'm also an attorney. I am a psychiatric survivor. I'm a MAD activist, and I've recently founded uh, an organization called MAD Freedom, um, whose mission is to secure political power to end the discrimination and oppression of people based on uh, mental status. And so I'm um, working with a number of other Vermonters uh, and people across the country um, in that endeavor. And I speak on behalf of that organization today. Um, you know, you've heard from uh, Commissioner Mike Sherling uh, from law enforcement, and you'll also hear from uh, law enforcement, uh, according to the agenda, um, at the end of this testimony. Uh, and unfortunately, what you're missing are the uh, voices um, whose gravitas uh, really um, added to the hearings before the uh, House uh, Healthcare Committee. Um, and I, I know that Kareem and I cannot adequately convey uh, that testimony. And so I, I hope that you will go back and, and review that testimony. Now, the time is short and it's really difficult to figure out how to use it, but based on what I've heard um, up until now, I think um, what I'd like to do is talk to you about um, the impact of this proposal on um, the, uh, the, the black community. Um, uh, I, uh, we are opposed to this uh, proposal. Um, and this is a proposal whose time has passed. Um, Commissioner Sherling talks about how he was baffled, why anyone could be opposed to it. And I have to express my bafflement at his bafflement. Um, in this post George Floyd, Daniel Prude era, it is imperative to eliminate law enforcement interactions with people with mental health and emotional distress, whether they're working with embedded mental health conditions or not, except perhaps in situations involving violence to others. Because of institutional racism, embedding mental health conditions with law enforcement is a combustible mix that will work to the detriment of and disadvantage of black and indigenous people. Currently, Black people are disproportionately killed by law enforcement, and Black people and Indigenous people are disproportionately diagnosed with mental illnesses by the mental health system. An alliance between law enforcement and the mental health system risks transforming mass incarceration into mass medicalization by turning Black people into mental health patients and subjecting them to yet more marginalization and oppression and furthering the racial caste system that has controlled Black people in this country for more than four centuries. Historically, mental illness and race have a troubled past. In the 1850s, American psychiatrists diagnosed escaped slaves with a mental health condition called drapetomania. Um, and it hasn't improved much since then. In 2005, the Washington Post ran a, first, a front page story with the headline, Racial Disparities Found and Pinpointing Mental Illness. The article detailed a research study that examined the largest registry of psychiatric patient records looking for, quote, ethnic trends and schizophrenia diagnoses. In the article, the Washington Post describes schizophrenia, quote, as a disorder that often portends years of powerful brain altering drugs, social ostracism and forced hospitalization that has been shown to affect all ethnic groups at the same rate. And yet, in the analysis of 135,000 cases, research revealed that doctors diagnose schizophrenia in black patients and particularly black men four times as often in white patients. According to the study's lead author, doctors overdiagnose um, schizophrenia in black men, even though the research team uncovered no evidence that quote, black patients were sicker than white patients or, other that, or that patients in either groups 
were more likely to suffer from drug addiction, poverty, depression, or a host of other variables. According to the lead author of the study, quote, the only factor that was truly important was race. These findings are not unique. There is a large body of research and literature that explores the processes through which American society equates race with mental illness and through which our definitions of both terms change as a result. For example, in his 2009 book, The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease, Jonathan Metzl demonstrated how schizophrenia was transformed from a largely white, middle-class, non-menacing disorder to one that is widely perceived as dangerous and threatening precisely at the time of the US Civil Rights Movement. The book shows the, that fears associated with urban violence and the rise of black power in the 1960s became an essential part of the very definition of schizophrenia. I can also offer a more recent and personal example of my own travels through the mental health system. In 2013, after I reported to my psychiatrist a traumatic encounter with a law enforcement officer during which he had unlawfully demanded to see my identification, my Harvard educated, educated $300 an hour psychiatrist working in private practice inserted a diagnosis into my medical record, which he withheld from me, but sent to my insurance company, diagnosing me with paranoid personality disorder. He explained the basis of his diagnosis as follows, and I'm quoting. She reported to me that she refused to show identification to the police officer because she was concerned that being black there was a higher chance that the male officer would mistake her for taking out a weapon instead of her identification, and consequently that a firearm would be discharged against her preemptively. It should also be noted that here in Vermont, non-white Vermonters are disproportionately represented in the highest levels of involuntary hospitalization. At Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, 15% of the patients held there are black and people of color. Allowing police officers to use their lay understanding of mental illness coupled with their implicit racial biases that, are, that, that I wanna make clear here that police officers are not the only ones with implicit racial biases, we all have them, but allowing them to use their lay understanding of mental illness coupled with their implicit racial bias will exacerbate the disproportionate rates that black and indigenous Vermonters are diagnosed with mental illnesses and perhaps overlook Vermonters who may indeed be in need of assistance. For example, several years ago, I was confronted by two police officers while I was walking on the Golden Gate Bridge in the middle of the night. The officers had received a call that a person was threatening to jump off the bridge. After talking to me for a few minutes, the officers decided to let me go because in the opinion of one of the officers, black women are too strong to kill themselves. In my opinion, such an attitude likely contributed to the indifference that allowed Sandra Bland to take her own life in that Texas jail cell. Police officers simply ill-equipped to determine who to refer for mental health treatment. I also want to, um, I'm gonna stop there because of time, but obviously I, I could go on. But I also wanna talk about something I was very troubled with uh, during testimony that um, Commissioner Sherlin gave uh, before the uh, House Health Care Committee. Um, I'm concerned because of the impact of this proposal on the Therapeutic Alliance and the right to privacy guaranteed by the US Constitution. That concern was raised most acutely when uh, Commissioner Sherling was asked by Representative Houghton the, the, the following question, and I'm quoting. So when you say, quote, embedded for state police, um, we have in Chittenden County, a community outreach team. What is the difference between those two models? And Commissioner Sherling responded, there's not a substantive difference in part because our model's not fully fleshed out yet. I know those teams do have direct access to their law enforcement agencies. They go to roll calls, they do ride alongs. In many instances, they actually carry radios. And that's something I think we would envision as well and have access to our computer generated dispatch and record management systems. That way they can see a call coming in or hear a call coming in. They can say, oh, I know John Smith. I've been working with him. I'm well suited to respond to that. I can take that call instead of sending an officer. Or they may choose to go with an officer. 
Or they may say, hey, John's been violent, a little violent recently. Once you get there and get things settled, let me know and I'll come over and I'll work with him. In my opinion, and it's my legal opinion, as you, many of you know, I am an attorney, this scenario described by Commissioner Sherling violates not only HIPAA, but an individual's constitutional right to privacy. Here, the clinician disclosed that John was their patient and disclosed the information they had acquired in the course of their patient-clinician relationship, specifically the opinion of the clinician that John had been, quote, a little violent. And this disclosure puts that client at risk because now the clinician has primed the responding law enforcement officers to expect violence. And when I look at the Vermont State Police's Directive 530, response to persons with mental illness or diminished capacity, I am simply cannot trust that this law enforcement agency has any understanding of who people are who carry this label of diagnosis of mental illness. For example, I'm quoting from this directive. It's entitled Maintaining Safety When Dealing with Mentally Ill Individuals. And it reads, dealing with individuals in enforcement and related contexts who are known or suspected to be mentally ill carries the potential for violence. Now, any interaction with law enforcement carries the potential of violence, but to, to say that it carries more of a potential of violence with people with mental illness is just plain wrong. It goes on to say, Given the unpredictable and sometimes violent nature of the mentally ill, again, we're objectified by reference to being called mentally ill, and then somehow we're, we're told that we have a nature, meaning our constitution. By our constitution, we are sometimes violent. Um, both Commissioner Squirrel has already told you that, that there is no evidence that links mental illness and violence. Um, we are no more likely to commit a crime. But this is the attitude um, from uh, our Vermont State Police, which is very, very troubling to me, particularly when we're going to be have clinicians who are divulging things from their therapeutic relationships that give officers the impression that their clients might be violent and thereby priming them for violence. In fact, it's, it's, it's very, very scary to me um, to have law enforcement and these mental health clinicians working so closely, closely together. Uh, and finally, I want to say, I think a lot of the testimony that was heard at the House Health Care Committee were alternatives to uh, this proposal that would more address the underlying issue rather than put a Band-Aid on it. Because what Commissioner Sherling is actually saying is that our mental health system is inadequate. He's saying they don't have the resources and people are falling through the cracks. And as they fall through the cracks, they're calling 911 and we are having to deal with it. But instead of trying to fix the mental health system, he is trying to apply a Band-Aid to that system and intercept the problem when, it, when they call 911, instead of creating community-based resources that would obviate the need to even call 911. And this is something that I see repeatedly in Vermont, an over-investment over in crisis and an under-investment in prevention and maintenance. Um, some of the... Well, the Wilda, I'm going to ask uh, if you don't mind for you to wrap up. I think your uh, testimony has been extremely helpful. I will end there. Thank you. And if you have additional comments, um, please do send them in to Nelly, and we'll post those on our web page so that we have access. Um, I have reviewed most of the uh, meeting, the House Health Care um, Committee meeting on this, and uh, I'm recommending that my committee also review that testimony as well. So thank you for bringing that in to your testimony. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, we're going to move on um, to George Karababakakis. I said it finally. Uh, George, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and give your um, testimony. Okay, uh, I am uh, George Karabakakis, CEO of uh, HCRS, uh, and we're the designated community mental health center serving Wyndham and Windsor counties. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you uh, for allowing me to be part of this uh, 
uh, committee. So I, I guess I, I have a question. Uh, how much time do we have? Because I know we were going till I just just to make sure. And I think uh, Lieutenant French was also going to speak to to our program. Right. So um, what I'm going to suggest uh, to our committee, because we have a little bit of fluidity uh, today, uh, that we're going to go until about 1015. So if you don't mind, um, we have 12 minutes. So I'm going to share that between you and uh, Anthony French. And if we and we'll we will take some time for questions. So. But. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I guess uh, I don't have a lot of time, but I do want to I want to talk about our experience and our programs uh, here in uh, southeastern Vermont. Uh, it was in uh, 2003 that we actually started working with the Bellows Falls Police Department to develop our police social work program. And it was so successful and it made such a difference in the community that uh, we started expanding that. Uh, we really looked everywhere for every bit of funding uh, that we could patch together to create programs. Uh, and those programs, uh, and we developed uh, police social work liaison programs uh, in uh, Brattleboro, Bellows Falls, Springfield, Windsor, we serve uh, Weathersfield, Hartford. Uh, we also, as of two and a half years ago, uh, have a uh, police social work liaison in the Westminster Barracks uh, as well, uh, which serves a very large region. And more recently, uh, we were fortunate enough to get a Health Resource Services Administration grant, HRSA grant, uh, in Wyndham County to uh, address the issue of substance use uh, and it was a community collaborative. And uh, so we have a police social work liaison in the Wyndham County Sheriff's Department and the Wilmington and Dover Police Departments. So we've been doing, so we've been providing these services for a long time. I have to say that uh, as we've heard, un the reality, unfortunately, the reality is that law enforcement is oftentimes the first stop when there are challenging situations related to mental health and substance use and domestic violence and a whole range of other issues that also include homelessness and uh, healthcare issues and a social service issues and all the unmet, as Commissioner Squirrel mentioned, all the unmet social service needs. These are the issues that oftentimes bring folks to law enforcement and having someone who is co-located, having someone from our agency that can be, be that connector, can be that, uh, that person who is working very closely with law enforcement to help people create connections, to help people get the services they need, to uh, sort of connect to all the other social services in our community. That's really been, uh, it's been a great collaboration and a great partnership. A lot of it has been about providing de-escalation, about establishing rapport, about monitoring and assessing individuals' needs and doing those conversations in people's homes, doing it on the street, doing it in the community, sitting at their uh, kitchen table and just getting a sense of what are the issues, what are the concerns, because most likely off, uh, it is not uh, getting someone connected to the criminal justice system isn't the answer. The answer is getting them support. The answer is listening to what those issues are and moving forward. Our team, uh, our staff are, uh, first of all, I just wanna say they are not, it is social work uh, in the broad sense, but they are not necessarily social workers. They might be case managers, community outreach staff. Uh, so I just wanna put that out there. Uh, and they, uh, they, as I think it was Deputy Commissioner, or maybe it was Commissioner Squirrel talked about the supervision, they are supervised and work really in uh, both individual and group supervision with our, uh, with our crisis coordinators primarily. Uh, many of them, uh, actually I think pretty much all, most of our crisis team, but and our police social work staff have gone through IPS or intentional peer support training, which I think is really critical, ensuring that their practices are consistent with, philosophy, with our philosophy of care. 
Uh, it is, uh, you know, I have to say that it is a work, you know, it's been 17 years, but it continues to be a work in progress. I do see this as an incredible opportunity to look at our system, to look at what we're doing. I absolutely agree. And I have to say, I really appreciate Karim's, Karim, your, your sharing uh, and certainly, uh, and Wilda and others have shared that the voice of the people that are most impacted do need to be part of this process. Absolutely. We have work to do, uh, I think, throughout our community. Uh, and uh, I think this is absolutely an opportunity to do that. Uh, I, we have a very strong peer support team and services uh, at our agency. I think we're really proud of the work they do uh, and feel that and, and know that those peer support services could be and should be very much a part of the response and understanding how to uh, move forward. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I think that's, you know, I'm just cognizant of the time. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stop there. Uh, and there's, I have so much more to say about our program and the details and how it's worked over the years, but I will um, hold back and uh, in, uh, in the interest of time and, and uh, go from there. Um, if it would be very helpful if you could get us something in writing and uh, maybe the, there are some specific recommendations that you've made as a result of your experiences. So if you can draw down on those experiences and send us your, uh, you know, your recommendations, that would be very helpful. Uh, I'll send it. Uh, I'll send it to Nellie. Right That'd after. be terrific. Yeah. Thank Great. you for that. Um, that. Uh, the more we have that we can reflect on, uh, the better our thinking. <laughs> and yeah. we're certainly getting a lot to think about today. So Absolutely. thank you very much. And thanks yeah. for your work on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Lieutenant French, um, you are up next and we appreciate your patience uh, in sitting through this uh, and, and being able to stay with us and share your information. So why don't you go right ahead? Uh, good morning and thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about the uh, very successful program that we have here at the Westminster Barracks. I'm Lieutenant Anthony French. I'm the station commander of the Westminster Barracks. Uh, I've been a trooper for over 22 years now. And a little bit of history, it's always been frustrating for me as a trooper on the road to see, have us respond to calls for social service needs or a person's experiencing mental health crises and not having the adequate uh, services to assist them, you know, we essentially put a Band-Aid on the problem and, and leave. Um, you know, there's times where we offer referrals for the, or have offered referrals for social services to hopefully get people pointed in the direction they need to go. Um, but that usually falls to the cracks and um, we really don't have follow through that, that we have now. So this, this position that we have in Westminster, uh, fortunately with a partnership with HCRS started about two and a half years ago. Um, and it is more than a crisis worker that responds to crisis situation. It's a person that's a liaison between the police and social services that provides families with the support they really need ranging from mental health, homelessness, uh, families dealing with dementia, domestic violence, drug addiction, and really the, the list goes on. Um, a little bit about the operational level, our police social worker does work out of the barracks. Uh, within the barracks, she's supervised by HCRS with input from me, the station commander. Uh, our local Police social worker also meets monthly with other social workers that, that are stationed at other police departments in the areas with that collaboration. So having the, the police social worker in the barracks, it really enables the troopers to actively involve her in cases. Uh, she does have a radio uh, and a computer so she can listen to the calls and see the calls for service that come in. Uh, if there's a way that she can help and the trooper hasn't reached out, she'll reach out to the trooper. But we've really 
come to the point now where the trooper is actively reaching out and trying to involve our police social worker in any way possible. Uh, I haven't seen and am not aware of any incidents where patient information has give, been given to a trooper from our police social worker. Uh, the troopers and her are very aware that it's a violation of privacy, so that hasn't been an issue. I know it was brought up as a concern. Um, the troopers also actively seek input on cases, so if there's case follow-up they are working on and they can refer it to her or just have the opportunity when there's time available to speak with her about the case that's going on and, and uh, find better solutions to deal with people's uh, problems than, than we really could do in a law enforcement setting. So the, our police social worker can respond to calls with the trooper in the cruiser or separately in a personal vehicle. Uh, it, it allows for better communication of the current situation. So when the call comes in, they're able to collaborate and kind of come up with a plan to best approach the situation. Um, with this situation, they both arrive on scene together. Uh, it's safer for the social worker and it's also giving the immediate need for mental health uh, on scene at the immediate, immediate time. So there's no lag time in between. Uh, this, this brings a resource to the rural areas of Vermont where it's difficult to get people resources. We have 25 towns. Uh, some people can be an hour away from uh, services that they so desperately need and they're not able to go get those services. So it, this allows us to bring the services to them. Um, when our police social worker is involved with a person on the street when we go to a call she's able to give them her card so this keeps them from having to call us directly or having to call the barracks directly for follow-up they now have a contact they have a face with a name a phone number to con call for follow-up visits so uh, this is really a large part of what she does is to help people get the services they need to be able to have that relationship with them. Um, it's really much more than a, you know, mental health crisis worker. It's a liaison that collaborates with many social services resources in the community to get people the help they need. Uh, a good example of this is a trooper going to a call where someone was looking needed service, and the police social worker asked to join in. On their way to the call, they knew they'd be traveling to another town where they dealt with a person the day prior who had very limited means uh, and abilities and needed food. On the way, the trooper and the police social worker stopped by the local food shelf, picked up a box of food, dropped it off to this person in need on the way. So here you have a, a person in need that had a meeting with a trooper and our police social worker and the follow-up to that was the trooper bringing them a box of food. It's an, it's an outside the box solution that troopers wouldn't have thought of without input from the police social worker. And this is the work towards building relationships between law enforcement and the community serve that we, that we really need. And uh, it's really the future of policing. Uh, another example to quickly give you is a family, that as many are struggling with an elderly family member with dementia, uh, which the person was sometimes combative. And instead of the troopers responding and diffusing the situation and leaving, our police social worker was able to work extensively with the family to get them the resources they needed, uh, which obviously led to a safer outcome for all, eliminating the calls for law enforcement to respond and really giving the family the support they needed in this situation. Uh, these daily interactions allow the troopers to really learn better ways to assist people in need. We, while they're back at the barracks, they can debrief incidents. It improves the collaboration with other resources that are available in the community. Um, when she's not available for immediate calls, the troopers can send an email requesting follow-up. Um, 
it's, it's really better than the mobile crisis response team being contacted to, re, to respond because the having the police social worker at the barracks, it really gives us the opportunity to have that collaboration and the relationship built up. We can arrive at cases, uh, incidents at the same time, and the police social worker is very comfortable with the troopers and there's no hesitation when an idea is developed to interject in the situation to say, hey, we should do it this way. This would be a better idea. Um, let's try this. So that's really the, the unique relationships that we need to build upon and to, to move forward. Um, as Mr. Chapman mentioned, it's, it's these collabor collaboration and communication between mental health, peer support, and law enforcement that, that we need, and, and that's gonna help move us for, forward. So I, I just wanna say that having the police social worker at Westminster has been extremely beneficial to the rural communities we serve. Uh, this collaboration has made tremendous improvement in the utilize, utilization of resources to get people the resources they need for long-term solutions. And I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but thank you for your time. No, that's just fine. Thank you very much. Um, that, that was very helpful. And it sounds like what you're doing in Westminster fits with uh, the communities in that area. Uh, so the, uh, the community outreach model that's being utilized uh, in my district also fits with, with the municipalities uh, there. So it, it, there is some diversity uh, in response. But we're trying what right now, I think uh, the question that our committee is going to have to wrestle with a little bit is on the administration of this and who's involved, how they're involved, what is in the MOU. And I, I you know, I think um, I want to just bring some closure to the discussion, but um, it, it will certainly be helpful for us as uh, legislators to know what is involved in the MOU and who's been involved in the development of that and how people are going to be included going forward. This is uh, when, we're, when we're writing a broad state policy that goes beyond the local response, uh, we need to get it right. So that, I think that's where, that's where the concerns are. I'm hearing those concerns across the board. Um, so, committee questions that you might have for any of our witnesses up to this point. Senator McCormick. Thanks. <clears throat> and I'm not sure who this is for, um, pro probably uh, for, for Anthony French. Uh, it seems to me you've got, you've got two fundamentally different functions designed to deal with two fundamentally different kinds of problems. On the one hand, the underlying problem of, of somebody, you know, who is going through a period of, of distress to the point of, you know, affecting their judgment. And on the one hand, which calls for a great deal of compassion, patience, working it through. But on the other hand, if that those problems, the underlying problem manifests itself in threatening behavior, dangerous behavior, the imperative is, is to make that stop quickly. So on the one hand, you've got the, the police officer as an authority figure who should be imposing his or her will. And on the other hand, the social worker as a compassionate person addressing the nuances of, of the, the underlying problem. There's nothing nuanced about a guy with a gun. You gotta get the gun out of his hand, okay? And, and yet there's underlying all that. The reason he's there with a gun is because of bigger problems. How do you reconcile these two very different kinds of functions? Feet on the ground. So that is a good question. It's um, we use our de-escalation skills and training to um, actively engage the person. And you know the troopers that are responding to these cases are you know normal people just like everybody in the community. So. Um, you know, we are the authoritative figure that is there for safety um, and that puts a stop to the violence. Um, 
but that's a last resort. We don't want to have to do that. We want yeah. to use the best solution possible. Um, it, that's why it's so important to be able to have this police social worker there and available to us to help de-escalate. And you know, when we're there and we have this other person that's not in uniform that we can kind of push to the forefront as the safety allows and let them control the conversation as we slowly back out. Um, it's really the best scenario uh, possible. There are situations where it doesn't go perfect and we do have to step in and the social worker has to step out. Um, but you know, at least we have the resources there at the time and available to try to do the best thing we can uh, for the immediate need. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, good I don't question. think that question invited a definitive final answer that was, oh, no. that settles it. <laughs> but thank you for your analysis. Right, I mean, each and each situation, each uh, program is going to have a slightly different answer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, we uh, obviously underestimated the time required for us to fully explore this issue, but we are at in a stage of the session where we don't have a lot of time. What I'm going to suggest is- Madam that Chair and Senator Cummings had her hand up. Oh. oh. Never mind. I was just trying to be nice. She said, oh, no, I, shook her I head, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <changed> her. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Uh, does anyone else have a question before I launch off and go forth and begin to commence? Okay. Um, I think we've, we've heard a lot. <laughs> and, and, you know, in, in past years, we've talked about how do we link the, uh, uh, the, district attorneys with uh, the local state's attorneys with mental health and mental health uh, organizations, the DAs and the SSAs. And so this is another one, uh, another con concern, and we all know it's a huge concern. And we know that there are racial disparities within the, the discussion and how to resolve some of those disparities at a local and a statewide level. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is the beginning of a very long conversation, which has some um, short-term implications as we look at the budget. We will be looking at the budget as a committee, and we will be thinking about how we might influence the direction that's taken um, within, and it sounds like the MOU is something that um, we, should, we should look at, and I may talk with Commissioner Squirrel and Commissioner Sherling about that. Um, having said that, committee, I think what I'd like for the committee to do, please, is to review the testimony that the House Health Care Committee received. It will be similar, um, but there, there is a YouTube recording on their web page, and you can find the date. I don't know exactly what day it is. It's yesterday, the day before, um, not clear. And Nellie, maybe you can help us find that and send a link out to everyone. So please do that. And then we will come back for a discussion of this at some point, uh, probably next week when we're looking at the budget. And any, Senator Cummings, you're muted. Um, I'd also be interested in hearing more about this peer support because I don't think we can have a peer in every um, instance, but I think statewide that peer support is an important, it's not the same as social work. Nope. Having been one of those potential social workers that could have gotten one of these jobs getting out of college, um, we start out pretty naive too, and we learn as we go. And I think it's how do you mesh all of that and have a system where you have someone available you can call um, in the you know in the instance you have. I think the social worker 
with the police departments is, is one thing, but then there's other resources that I think we need to look at. Yes, thank you for that comment. And I think pay attention to that as you're looking at the house uh, health care testimony. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions committee? Wow, okay, well, we have walked right over our opportunity to dive further into H611. So we're gonna postpone our H611 discussion until later this morning uh, with apologies to representatives Noise and Wood, uh, but Jen Carby cannot be here. So it'll be uh, our, our committee having a conversation. You are welcome to stay with us as is Ruby welcome to be here as well, Ruby Baker. So, um, but we are gonna move now from this topic to um, the COVID-19 uh, school and public health response and spend a few minutes more on that. We have with us Ted Fisher and then um, Brina Holmes will be joining us as well. So we'll look at that, come back to that issue. Okay, thank you all for being with us on the uh, on this mental health, on the mental health public safety issue. I know it's uh, complex and uh, it, but we need to get it right. And we're gonna try to do that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So Ted, you are here. Nellie, can you remind me what time um, Brina Holmes is going to be joining us. Uh, she'll be joining us at 11. Yeah, so we have a whole hour for this. What I'm going to suggest um, is that we have heard from Ted previously. Ted, you heard some of our questions and concerns last time, and in particular with respect to um, safety measures being taken for teachers who might be vulnerable. Uh, that was a, a big question that we had. And you had indicated that um, that would be a contractual discussion or uh, there might be other laws affecting that. So uh, maybe you can come back, start out with responses to some of the questions that we had the other day. I, I suspect that we will not go, uh, we are not gonna go until 11. We might revert to a conversation about H611 or H607. So. Let, let's let's uh, see how far we get. Hi, good morning, senators. Uh, can the committee hear me? Yes, terrific. Awesome. Um, so, uh, and I apologize. Actually, I um, I'm I would be happy to answer those questions. I uh, w I wanted to signpost that I actually am am have been asked to join your sister committee in the house. 11. So I'm sorry that I will not uh, overlap with uh, Dr. Brina Holmes, who we have enjoyed working very closely with in the House. I'm just trying to pull up. I sent a response to Senator McCormick this morning. I also want to note that um, Senator, uh, uh, excuse me, Deputy uh, Secretary Boucher may be joining us. Um, it looks like she's coming into the meeting right now. Um, so uh, so uh, when you sent Senator McCormick a response to a question that he asked during the committee. And correct. So, our, would be so if you don't mind in the future, if you could send those responses to Nellie and to the entire committee so that we have it of on. Of course, my apologies. Helpful. Absolutely. That, no, don't apologize. It's understood. So I'm, I figured we would have a chance to chat about it today. So I'm just having an issue with my outlook. So if you'll bear with me. One moment. Um, so, so this is with regard to the question about um, whether or not, uh, like, the like state level accommodations for school staff who may have um, medical concerns that are related to COVID. Um, I know that Secretary French uh, discussed this uh, during the All Senate uh, meeting a few weeks ago. I followed up with him. The, uh, the, the crux of this comes down to the Americans with Disabilities Act um, in terms of providing accommodations. Um, the, the, the roadblock to providing a sort of a statewide solution is that 
um, the uh, work environment of educators looks different depending on both the school um, and also on what uh, what their individual uh, um, needs of the educator might be in terms of what what the health risks might be. It's really a case by case uh, basis. Secretary French used an example that he reminded me about um, because this uh, act, of course, predates COVID. If you had an, a teacher, for example, who broke their leg and taught on the second floor, a, a accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act might be arranging their rearranging their classroom so that they're on the first floor. Now that might work for school A, which has multiple floors of classrooms. In school B, an accommodation might not even be needed because um, because uh, their school B, for example, may be a single floor, right? So that teacher may not ever need uh, to navigate up a, a set of stairs. So that was that was the sort of the hypothetical example he used. This is something that schools deal with and have dealt with since the passage of the ADA in terms of coming up with requirements. It is a medical, you know, it's a, an issue. The, the Our guidance, the Strong and Healthy Start guidance, directs uh, school staff to contact their providers to identify their risk. Um, and then, and then, that, then they can work with their school district to make sure that there are accommodations. In some of those cases, uh, in some cases, it may be that um, working remotely and 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 teaching remotely is is the safest and best thing to do. In other cases, there may be other accommodations. But that's really sort of a case by case discussion with a medical provider and with the employer, which would be a school district, or would also be a um, uh, possibly an independent school if, if the educator works in that environment. Um, uh, you know, one of the things to just note here is that uh, we're, we're very quickly discovering that there is a very large diversity of schools and there is no one size fits all approach for a lot of these health and safety guidances. Um, so that is one, one of the potential uh, issues at stake in this conversation and other parts of the health and safety guidance. And I will make sure, um, uh, Madam Chair, that 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 written version, I will forward that to, to, to Nellie so that the whole committee has it for their records. Um, thank you. I do remember when uh, Secretary French came before the entire Senate, I asked this question and his response was, it's an ADA question. However, if we look at schools as just one workplace, the ADA affects, I think, literally every workplace, municipal buildings, uh, restaurants, um, other businesses. And so it, <laughs> we have passed public health safety guidelines that has based on the public health um, emergency that we're in. And we've, we've said, you know, the, you don't have to go to work. I mean, you can work remotely and people are protected uh, from being exposed to uh, the disease. And we know that kids are carriers. So um, it concerns me just a little bit that we're having uh, teachers having to negotiate safety uh, in an era of unsafe uh, public health. So uh, I, t I give you that question. I don't know if you can answer it or perhaps it's a discussion that we have with Dr. Holmes, um, and I see that you're here, Dr. Holmes. I don't know if you can join the conversation or not. Not yet. Okay. So, um, but so, Ted, is there is there a response to that? Doesn't this doesn't or oh, I see Dep 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 Deputy Secretary Boucher. Thank you for being here. Or Bu is it Bushy or Boucher? Sorry. It's Boucher. Just okay. To, good. Just to mix things up. I know it's confusing. <laughs> okay. Did you want to uh, weigh in on this uh, topic? It's been a topic of concern for some time. Sure, sure. And, and we definitely recognize that. Um, I, I think um, the intentionality of the guidance was, was not meant to leave it solely up to teachers, to, you know, individual teachers. I mean, they're really supposed to be working in partnership with their doctor. And so mm. if their doctor... Um, really believes that the situation is not a safe one for them, then that's what they go to um, 
their their local um, authorities in terms of HR, in terms of the school, the district leadership to say, hey, my doctor, uh, you know, my doctor agrees. I'm in the at risk group. This is not a safe place for me to be. Um, we would certainly want to know if that's happening, if that is happening, and then there's pushback, um, because that would actually be, we would consider quite problematic. Um, so I do, I, I think it's a little tweak, um, Chairwoman Lyons, with what you were asking, but I do think it's an important piece that we're not just, um, we're, tr we're not trying to just sort of leave it up to teachers to be kind of battling for their safety, that it really, you know, it really needs to be in partnership with their own health provider who knows them best and can actually make that determination with them. I see um, Dr. Holmes is on now as well. Oh, good. That's great. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the committee. It's good to see you again. Dr. Holmes. You as well, Senator Lyons. I have a, a document to share with the committee that may be of interest uh, in this arena, which was written by the adult infectious disease and primary adult primary care community to guide okay. uh, the, the shared decision making between educators, school staff and their medical homes. That which was exactly for this purpose to really make a shared decision based on uh, individual health information that we really couldn't standardize in any kind of a guidance document. By way of explanation, I think the chair is frozen. That's why we're when nothing is happening. Oh, that is so helpful, Senator. I thought that I was speaking into a black hole. No. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it just it felt very odd. <laughs> you, had, you had spoken and suddenly everything was silent. Rich, Rich, are you our vice chair? Um, yes, I think <laughs> I am. Um, <laughs> I, why don't we wait a minute? Um, um, because I suspect Ginny is rushing to get back on. Oh, I, I bet it's mayhem. <laughs> Intense anxiety. <sighs> If she's not in um, two or three minutes, we'll pick up and go ahead. Yeah. Nellie, are you there? I am, yes. I'm, uh, I'm emailing her the Zoom information again to hopefully get her back on. Okay. I know the instant I go to get another cup of coffee, she's going to be back on. So she is, in fact, she's coming back on right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'd go get one, anyways. <laughs> in between the people, I go and get tea water. So you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. I, uh, Hello, Madam Chair. We thought yeah, you'd be back. Uh, it, it was my internet um, just decided that it didn't want to participate. <laughs> Did anybody else go offline or was it just me? No, we were all sitting just here me. saying, just you. In front of you. I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Holmes, sorry about that. Um, were you going to share on your screen? The information that you had or 
Send it to us. It's it's your what what is your preference? I'll, it would take me a few minutes to search and find in the mayhem of no, my that's inbox, okay. uh, and then nope. I should just send it. I think great. No, just send it. It's fine. That's all we need to know. Um, and I will say that Senator Ingram is testifying in another committee, so that's why she's not here with us. But the question that we've been kind of wrestling with is how uh, we have a lot of questions for you uh, from the depart for the Department of Health. But the question we've been wrestling with regarding um, the COVID and public health for teachers is how teachers might recuse themselves or not go to work because they feel they're vulnerable. And so um, Deputy Secretary Boucher uh, indicates that uh, there's, some, there's a medical communication. So the physician would make that recommendation based on the patient's status or the teacher's status. <coughs> Are there other general guidelines from the Department of Health? Yes, so that's what I'll share with you. I think the part that is uh, most important and of interest is this is a shared decision-making experience between a clinician and a, a teacher. Uh, the list that the CDC produces of chronic conditions which infer some increased risk during a time of COVID is long and extensive and would preclude almost and you know a large proportion of our adult population working so it is really about uh, how well is your chronic condition managed and what is your vulnerability so it has to be done at the in a shared way i don't think that uh, adult physicians are um, in some situation where they're making the decision they're guiding and uh, but it is really important, and we'll talk more about this during my presentation. Schools are a very safe place to work based on all the mitigation strategies and how hard so many people have worked to set them up to be uh, abiding by COVID prevention strategies. Mm -hmm. And I did hear you say, Senator Lyons, um, that children carry this virus. I think we can certainly address that. Uh, they do uh, have the virus in their nose at times and they are known to when tested with, to have no symptoms and test positive, but they do not spread this virus the way adults do. They are not the vector of this pandemic the way most viruses are. And I think this is getting out in the, the outside of the medical world, but we have to say it all the time to each other. Almost every virus in our world we get from kids and we're, we're used to as pediatricians and teachers and we're used to the kid with the runny nose and then we get it and we're sick for a week. And that's not true with COVID. Children get this virus from adults almost always. It's an extraordinary flip of science. And we don't know why, but it's important in the school conversation. This this is Ted from AOE again. Um, it looks like I've lost video. Um, I'm trying to rejoin. I just wanted to to note um, uh, one thing before we we move on. Uh, in addition to Dr. Holmes's excellent comments and and what the secret, uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher noted. Um, it, it's important to just, I wanted to reinforce what I said earlier is that, you know, it, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a, um, you know, is an obligation, right? It, it predates COVID-19, obviously, but, you know, working with the provider, um, if working with the provider, uh, the teacher and, and the provider uh, identify an issue that, that makes them unsafe working in schools, and the, the schools do have to to work to to accommodate and provide a reasonable accommodation there. So that that's why Secretary French has has phone you know back on that in, in answers and, and and why we're providing the answer we are today. Okay, this, thank you for that. This, the, everything is starting to uh, the clouds are clearing, so this is very helpful. Um, I, I'm going to ask um, Ted, you or Deputy Secretary Boucher, if you have. Anything more to add? We, you have been in to committee previously with some uh, testimony. So if you have something to add that would be helpful. Otherwise, I think we'll move to Dr. Holmes and listen to her testimony. Uh, and then we'll come back for um, questions and discussion 
uh, with the committee and the group as a whole. Okay. Okay. Hearing nothing further, I will turn. We'll turn uh, to Dr. Holmes. Good morning, everyone. I am going to share my screen, holding my breath because <laughs> technology has been. Uh, Boy, have I learned a lot. Uh, let me pull up, as I'm sure you have, about technology. So well, I am Dr. Sure. Brina Holmes, Sorry. for the record. Sorry. Yes, I did want to update you on a title change. You know, you've know, you known me for 10 years as the Director of Maternal and Child Health at the Vermont Department of Health. Uh, Pre-COVID, I had made I was starting to make a transition to be on the faculty at the Larner College of Medicine Department of Pediatrics on the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program. Then the pandemic hit. It did not seem like the right time to step away from my beloved colleagues at the health department. So after much ado, uh, Tuesday, September 8th, I have taken on, I'm going to be the uh, medical advisor to the Maternal and Child Health Division, 40% and keep us going in the school and child care work that has been essential from our division. And then the 60% I'll be joining the Department of Pediatrics at the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program. So sorry for those four, that's too many sentences, but uh, in, it does create some confusion. Thank you. I just, and congratulations, but also our, condolences oh, to the Department of Health. <laughs> I think it's gonna be okay. Thank you, Senator Lyons. The, um, Alisa Stahlberg is our beloved deputy director. She's become the MCH director uh, and really has all the structure, budget, supervision. She's amazing. The only piece she didn't have was the medical background. So keeping me on in that capacity is gonna be, um, I think the right team. And I certainly hope to still come before your committee in this meant whenever you need me to, because. I've enjoyed it and 40% is should be enough. Maybe <laughs> all say, you know, no one wants to make a transition during uh, a pandemic. So can you see my slides? Has magic occurred? Yes. Okay. So uh, these, I have um, some general remarks I really want to make about this journey because I'm so proud of it. And then I really want there to be time for questions. So um, if you all hold me to, if this is beyond the time we have allotted, I, I, I know I have till 11. So let's see if we can get some of the uh, structural stuff out and then spend the time in more of a conversation. Uh, I wanted to start with gratitude. I, you're all working so hard. We're all working so hard. I have never been more proud to be part of Vermont's uh, state system. And uh, it's a very uncertain time. So I also wanted to acknowledge that this virus was not known on the planet until December of 2019. So mo more than ever in my medical career, I've had to go back to a group and say, I said something incorrect yesterday or something changed in the way that we have come to know that something about this virus. So please bear with us with, I have a lot of humility about information. I, I wanted to put uh, the reopening of schools in context because the national story is not the Vermont story. And I think it's getting conflated and must be one of the many sources of fear in our state. Uh, the CDC has guidance about reopening schools. The American Academy of Pediatrics has guidance. And uh, we're really proud in Vermont because we had a comprehensive and continue to have a comprehensive and thoughtful approach with a really strong multidisciplinary team, which I really don't think any other state has. We have tons of physicians. We actually have half of our group was from the medical field and the other half were uh, educational leaders. We also uh, monitor our data so darn carefully in Vermont that we are going to know and continue to know if safety is in any jeopardy here in the uh, opening of schools. And then I'm sure you've heard and been following that our pediatric medical community has been one of the uh, outstanding leading, leaders and champions in the efforts to reopen our schools. 
So no need to make the case to you all with your backgrounds, but uh, there are uh, kids are not doing well in their isolation. And we also have to remind some audiences that schools provide way, way, way more than traditional learning experiences. It's where children connect. It's where we uh, meet and address social emotional needs. It's where children access healthy foods, physical activity, and kids, particularly kids with additional vulnerabilities, uh, schools are their epicenter. Okay, here's the uh, one slide for you know nine months of science. So far, this is what we know and agree on, despite uh, the media picking up on some cases and episodic studies that show something different about children and COVID. The vast majority of literature supports these four sentences. Children are less likely to get COVID. No matter how you slice it, where you look around the world, where you look around our country, this is not a pediatric disease. Now, that doesn't mean kids don't get it, but they're less likely. They do not get that sick, except, of course, a few kids do. We've had no children in the state of Vermont hospitalized with COVID. Zero. And we're up over 200 uh, cases documented since March in kids 0 to 19. We also know that the, particularly the younger kids don't transmit this virus. And we have study after study of little kids who have COVID that they got from an adult exposing a classroom setting or exposing a larger household and no one contracts it from that kid. And then we really have to look in Vermont to the countries with low prevalence of this disease to decide about the success of our opening and how well we're gonna do. And this was more relevant before September 8th, because here we are. But we should not be comparing ourselves to Georgia or Florida or Texas, because we have such low prevalence of the disease. The two pediatric infectious disease doctors at UVM are nationally known for their work with COVID. And this happens all the time in Vermont. We get so lucky with our experts and our pediatric leaders. And, you know, there's a long history of why Vermont's pediatric community is so, so famous. But Benley and Bill Raska are on the national news. They write editorials for our national journals. And they're the ones that um, were on our task force to reopen schools. So here's who was on it. Maybe you already know this, but we had representation from superintendents, principals, the independent schools, our great school nurses. The NEA was there. We had special educators the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program, the infectious disease doctors, we had general pediatricians, school psychologists, we had our transportation colleagues, and uh, Heather and Ted, and tons of people from the health department as well, including our state epidemiologist. We sent the draft, this is all way back in June, we sent it to parents, we shared it with our Vermont After School Coalition, the Vermont RAISE, which is an adolescent health advisory group at UVM, through uh, the teachers through NEA, and we also shared it with additional pediatric colleagues for geographic diversity. It was published June 16th. I'm super proud of that. The AOE and the health department partnered beautifully to get this out before school administrators left their buildings or left their the 2019-20 school year. And then we revised it August 11th based on new science and information, and we're gonna revise it again. Uh, not, you know, every ditzel and not every week, but as we learned in our childcare experience, we need to stay vigilant and meet probably monthly to continue to make the document as accurate and up-to-date as possible. Uh, it's helpful for folks that are working in, in schools or supporting people who work in schools to think about these concepts. I'll just highlight the first three. The way you prevent uh, outbreaks in general in states, but in schools would be, you got to stop the virus from getting in the building, decrease the risk. And you do that with staying home when you're sick and health screenings, checking temperatures. And once you're in the building, if the virus gets in, which it will, we have to stop it from spreading between people. And you do that with masks almost entirely and cleaning and distancing. And then once there's a case in a building, 
you have to contain it. And you do that with quick identification, testing of close contacts, and our contact tracing team, which is truly unbelievable. And my, the, one of the sources of my greatest pride as a health department employee. So we ask for COVID coordination. All districts have complied with this. We have amazing leaders who reach out to us every day to help interpret the guidance. It's almost always a school nurse, which was our vision and our hope. In some communities where they needed their school nurses to focus on um, other tasks, they were able to find other health professionals to play this role. There's been a lot of talk about steps. I, I could talk about this more if you want. Uh, Vermont has been in step three, which is an epidemiologic step from the CDC since May. We, we're in step three because we have such low prevalence of the virus. The schools asked to start in step two, which was a very reasonable request because they wanted to get their set, the setup correct in the uh, event that they needed to step back to a more prescriptive situation. The primary difference between step two and three as it relates to a school building is the attention to the distancing and the use of the gymnasium and the um, uh, cafeteria. Of quick note, we did require or recommend that, that buses could be right away in step three because six foot distancing is not possible on, public, on buses. So we have a ton to tell you and I don't want to uh, spend too much time, but please know that the health department's website has developed specific tools uh, and the AOE shares them as well for schools to be ready for cases because it's inevitable. This is not a, an if situation, it's a when. And the reason we say that is because we know what to do and we don't want any kind of drift into what I call the limbic system or the part of your brain where you're in um, anxiety and fear. We want you to know that a case has come and that the health department knows exactly what to do. A uh, little bit here, these slides will be available to you for your review, but this is where we made a shift in our health screening. We're now asking parents to do the symptom screen at home. The temperature screen is at first point of contact. One of the biggest changes in our society since COVID is we have to stay home when we're sick. And I will be the first to tell you, we botched this before COVID. My goodness, we were letting sick people everywhere including in the health department. I would sit in meetings with people coughing and coughing and think, you need to go home. And schools and child cares were terrible. We, we were so pressed to have people at work and, and kids in their education settings that we forgot really basic public health that it wasn't good to be allowing any of these symptoms pre-COVID in our mix. So it's been actually an interesting uh, somewhat healthy experience since March to have people staying home sick. Uh, we do recognize, this is the slide to address what Senator Lyons mentioned, uh, we really want the shared decision-making between staff and medical homes. And I sent Nellie the one pager that we wrote to guide health adult doctors, infectious disease and primary care to talk with teachers. A little bit more about the importance of uh, exclusion for being sick. I hate the word exclusion because it means something different in education that's not strength-based, but in, he in this uh, circumstance, it means zero tolerance for sick people in your building. We have very good language and uh, school nurses understand deeply what to do with allergy and asthma. Those kids are not excluded, but we need uh, conversations with doctors and teams to identify kids with those chronic conditions. We've had a lot of good work on children with special health needs. We have a um, separate group of people that have produced some uh, guidance and checklists around what to do with special education, special health needs. Heather, uh, Dep Deputy Secretary Boucher and her team have incredible social emotional learning documents. So it's been a really powerful partnership between public health and the agency of education. And we are really proud of our guidance. 
So I'm not going to go through everything here because you'll have it, but just wanted you to see the breadth of what we address in our guidance. We address buses. We address the drop-off and pickup protocols. We've heard from our schools since Tuesday that they anticipated an hour of entry that it was going to take for drop-off and adequate screening, and it's taking about 30 minutes. So already we've set nice protocols and expectations in place that it was going to be delayed, and we're seeing that folks are really rocking this. The conversation about facial coverings is really important. Uh, it's required that everyone wear coverings. We have a document coming out this week about the very, very rare medical exemption to not wear a mask for children. And it's coming from the pediatric subspecialists, and I'm talking about respiratory specialists, cancer specialists, developmental and behavioral specialists, psychiatric specialists, and they're, I'll give you a spoiler alert because it's coming out tomorrow. There's almost no condition you can't wear a mask. So please know when you hear from folks that their child cannot medically wear a mask that that's not lining up with our medical subspecialists. That being said, there are developmental considerations. And in our child care guidance, we say it's strongly recommended because three-year-olds are really, really working on this, but they can't leave them on all day, and that's just pure child development. And we didn't want to get in a punitive restrictive space. We have that uh, interesting and important uh, public-private um, mixed delivery for our pre-K. So the three- and four-year-olds in our public school systems are required to wear masks but we have a line in the guidance that says, please give them special consideration. In our private pre-K situation, they follow the child care guidance, which strongly recommends. So I'm just calling out that difference. It's not my style to have that kind of a difference, but it was important and necessary, and we can talk more about it. We address all sorts of group size and the integrity of the group. This is a, a source of great media attention. We have to mix groups in Vermont because we're having kids go to childcare and out of school time because our schools are hybrid. So we couldn't, we can't say a same group of kids stay together all day because there's so many different venues in which children are moving. We feel this is safe based on all the mitigation strategies and our low prevalence. The physical distancing pieces of our work have been extremely interesting. The data and the scientists tell us that little kids can be three feet apart with minimal risk. So that's why we amended our guidance in August to say, pre-K through grade five, the kids should be allowed to be between three and six feet. That appeared to be somewhat the six foot rule was prohibitive for some schools. So we went further in the guidance and said, you can be in person now because we gave you the distance. And schools have taken that seriously and they're working toward that. We're still recommending six feet for kids over from sixth grade and up. And then we really want people to uh, understand that in the circumstances where you can't be six feet apart, which is a lot of times in education, that's when you just, you know, you hone in on the facial covering. Childcare, which has been in my wheelhouse since March, there's nobody six feet apart in childcare by de definition. These kids are toddlers and infants, and they're in the laps of their caregivers. And we have had almost no spread when adults have brought COVID into those buildings. And COVID has come into child serving settings because adults have had the virus. And when they do, we contain it. We tell the families, the kids are uh, quarantined, some of them are tested, and there's been almost no kids with some cases. There were a few out of hundreds of exposures. A little bit more about group size on this slide. We address libraries, extracurricular, gyms, cafeterias, fire and safety drills, playgrounds and recess. We address volunteers, field trips, and parental visits. We spend a ton of time on cleaning, we've become environmental health experts on my childcare and school team. 
the food service people are heroes of this story. I just wanted to call them out because they fed families all summer and they figured out how to do this. And also food service folks by design understand infection. So this has been a very successful part of our COVID response. And I just wanted to acknowledge their greatness. We have incredible communication uh, information and tools. And I also wanted to say that we asked our pediatric community to go find a school to work with. And we have more than dozens of examples of, of pediatricians who have made videos with schools, have gone to school boards, have partnered up with school nurses, and have uh, made sure that this was a community effort to get schools open safely. I think you, you probably have already had talks about what to do when there's a case. But uh, suffice it to say that we now have documents for school administrators to read ahead of time. But the biggest uh, lesson here is to trust our contact tracing process. 96% of folks that have COVID in Vermont have been contacted within 24 hours since March. I'm not even, I can't even tell you how proud I am of that. In most states, it's 60 and it's just diligence and great leadership and really, really committed Vermonters. The decision to close a school is gonna be made with uh, agency of ed superintendents and the health department. We're not gonna close schools. We will close a classroom if we need to. And one of the most interesting parts about COVID is when you go through close contact and you find yourself trying to make a list of who needs to quarantine, it's never as long as you think. So if a teacher gets COVID, I doubt the classroom is going to all be considered close contact because you have to have prolonged exposure with pretty close up. And I can't speak more to it because it's individualized based on the symptoms of the person with COVID, when they were symptomatic, and it's too hard to make a blanket statement. But in childcare, when we get the call on a Sunday that a teacher has COVID, we all, our heart sinks for a sec because it's, you know, we want success so deeply. And then the next day we find out there were only two kids that were considered close contact and we're just so relieved. So please know that this piece is our strongest. And this is just some more slides for you all on what is contact tracing. Uh, it, it's so easy in schools because schools keep attendance and I, it'll be just a little, um, Shout out to, uh, well, a reminder to all of us what the health commissioner says. It, we as citizens need to know where we've been the last 14 days in our behavior and our movement. And when we contact trace, we realize people don't know where they were, but schools know where the kids were. So this is going to be easy, including buses. We know where kids sit on buses. We know where kids are in a school building. And I did want you to know that all summer, all spring and summer, we've had four public health nurses on the phone with our school and child care and summer program uh, administrators answering questions. We now have eight humans. I'm so proud of this as well because we asked our emergency operations team for to double our staff so that we could answer all questions all day long, as small, medium, and large as they need to be to keep schools uh, moving forward. I'm sure you found our website. I'm also very proud of that. And I'm going to leave it there, Senator Lyons, and see what questions have come up. And I probably way past. Oh, no, I have to 1130. I did pretty well. No, you did great. Uh, this is this has been a, uh, obviously our committee has a significant uh, role to play in understanding this. And you have just brought us some understanding and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Um, before I ask questions, I want would like to ask the de Deputy Secretary to introduce herself for the record. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Heather Boucher, uh, a Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Education. Thank you. For the record. Oh, thank good. You. Now now we're all official. Oh, good. We're, now you're for the record. You're all official. Thank you. Um, Dr. Holmes, thank you very much for that. Um, I did, uh, I did uh, understand in, in conversations with Dr. First at the uh, 
at the medical center understand that K through five kids are probably more able to attend school for the entire day. Is that, is that, was that a consideration that was given during um, the di discussion about how to open schools? I know there are concerns about um, teachers and kids and so on, um, and you've clarified that a little bit, but are K through five schools opening up completely or are there still remote uh, learning? And I guess that's a question for both you and Dr. Boucher. Yeah, I'll answer the health piece and then I'll let the deputy secretary. So um, yes, so that's exactly what happened between June and August. So the first iteration of our guidance uh, used a lot of sort of CDC words like stay six feet apart when possible. And we heard right away from superintendents that in order to meet the standard and try to get everybody six feet apart, they were not gonna be able to have everybody in the school building, regardless of age. So we spent the month of August with the task force bringing the scientists back in, infectious disease doctors to say, here's what the science really says. You can be closer than six feet if you're in a younger age group because they're not transmitting this virus. So we brought that to the task force. The task force heard the evidence and agreed that our new guy, our revision, which was August 11th, would state very strongly that the science has shown pre-K through grade five, which people call me out for being arbitrary. Of course it's arbitrary, right? You have to pick a cutoff. The science studies kids 0 to 9, 0 to 10, 0 to 11, but the consensus was that in those grades, the distance should not be prohibitive and that we really recommended in-person learning. And that being said, we also really admire our uh, district school leadership where they said, okay, we're going to work toward that, but we have to start in a place where we can get the logistics right. And I'll turn it over to Deputy Secretary to talk about that. So it's not a yes, it, it's not a um, once we said it, everybody just open elementary schools full time. That is our uh, vision, but there's it's iterative. Sure, um, and I would uh, definitely echo um, what Dr. Holmes said. Um, a couple of things, that's exactly right. So uh, the committee that worked on the guidance uh, definitely heard from the education folks and it made logical sense that we would start uh, in step two at a more restrictive level in terms of um, precautions so that um, should we, should a particular school or classroom um, have to move back to a more restrictive um, set of, uh, um, a set of um, practices that they would be ready to do that. Um, we know um, that right now about 80% of our districts are have adopted a hybrid model um, where in some kind of um, pattern, students are doing both remote learning and um, in-person learning. There's a small percentage of districts and schools that are doing solely in person and uh, similarly a small percentage that are doing solely um, all remote. It was important for us to allow that flexibility, especially as we first started out because each district had to think about their own set of schools and what the physical distancing might look like in those schools. As we all know, they're, they're very different across the state. They also had to navigate different community factors. So for some of the um, districts, there was a real push from parents that they, they did not want to send their students back to school for it. <laughs> so I think those are places that have a heavier remote component. In other communities, um, many more parents were of the opposite um, standpoint saying, I need to get to work myself. So I need the schools to be open. Um, so I, I know there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that there, there hasn't been kind of a top down one size, everyone, everyone do the same thing. 
And I think I just wanted to clarify um, that that those are the reasons that that um, there are really different factors, both in terms of the physical logistics of different schools across the state, and then also um, what works best for for each community. Um, I do want to also note, and we'd be happy to come back in and talk further with the committee that the Agency of Ed is actually developing a new collection data collection tool so that we will actually be monitoring exactly how many elementary schools, how many uh, middle schools, how many high schools are in these different dispositions, are in fully remote, are in fully in person, are in a hybrid model as we move forward. And the piece about the hybrid model that I said, um, it's, it's, it's a big catch-all because some, some districts have students in for two days in person, usually a shortened time frame, couple, two to three hours. Um, some have students in for five hour, five days uh, of mornings or five days of afternoons. They really are um, quite idiosyncratic to the local um, need, we would, we would um, state and actually agree with that approach. Again, um, we're working with a pandemic and we needed to make the situation so that our local entities could figure out what worked best for them. Um, there was another piece that I was thinking of, but it will come back to me. <laughs> okay. I, I right. hope that answered, Madam Chair. No, um, no, that's, th that's very helpful. We understand the, the question I think that our committee has had from the beginning really was the overarching uh, public health guidelines and guidance that would help regardless of the school or district involved. So, right. and, and, I, and I think we're getting that answer. This has been very helpful. Uh, I do have a question and then I'll, uh, I have two questions. Um, one is on the criteria that Department of Health is going to be using for, and you've, you have addressed this, uh, Dr. Holmes, so it's, it's not that you haven't addressed it, but there are times when a school might be closed down completely. We saw that uh, in the springtime when schools were just shut down categorically because of the immensity of the pandemic. Um, what criteria does the Department of Health have a set criteria or criterion for um, closing down schools, you talked about closing down classrooms and the contact tracing, that was, that's all very helpful, but are there sort of risk levels that you're looking at that would suggest uh, that we should be either shutting down a school, a district, or the state again? How is that being looked at? Uh, anticipating well, the possibles. So, yeah. A couple of really important concepts here. Um, we didn't know what we were doing in March Right. We had no testing. We had no contact tracing. We had never lived through a pandemic. So that feeling that we're all still carrying of like, we got to close is, is not anywhere where we are now. And I, and I really don't anticipate being there. You know, we, uh, we will know when we have a case and then we will know who that person was in contact with and all of those people will be advised to quarantine and then the, the school will continue business as usual. And that we've had so much experience with that with childcare, summer camps, other work sites, long-term care facilities, even our correction system. So uh, I, just, I just really don't see it coming. That being said, the Secretary of Education and the Commissioner of Health talk about this a lot. We don't mm -hmm. think we're the kind of state that sets some arbitrary number because it, we're so uh, easily able to have the conversation of what is the unique experience. And we know how to define an outbreak and we will, uh, and we're not, we, the minute we have an outbreak, we call it an outbreak. You know, we're not afraid of the word. It's, I hate the word, but, <laughs> and then we, uh, we get the public to understand and then we move forward. So to me saying, you know, you have to always know your denominator before you make a numerator. And we wouldn't be able to say six cases in a school means closing because for one school, that could be the whole kindergarten. And for another, it could be 0.5% of the population. So 
Please no. I mean, one of my, um, there are silver lining. I don't know what the term is of the, some of the small gifts in this terrible time, but the way that uh, the health department and the agency of education are working together right now is fabulous. We talk every day and my team meets with Ted's team every Friday and we, we make all our tools together and, and as Dep Deputy Secretary said, we're going to we're looking at the data together. We're going to report the data together. Uh, I just don't think you're going to get an arbitrary number out in the public that says what would warrant a change. I will tell you what I know from other states. The school is just a, a mirror of the community. So if a community is experiencing an uptick in the virus, then we're going to start to see it in our school systems. So mm -hmm. the, the lesson here is for the community to continue all of the great efforts to keep the virus down so that our schools can do their thing. I did want to say one other thing while I'm unmuted because my, my, so Johns Hopkins did this amazing analysis of school reopening plans and they gave Vermont a 10 out of 12, which put us in the top 5%. And the only reason we didn't get a 12, and please forgive my perfection, is <laughs> they included um, parental choice and teacher choice as metrics in their health guidance analysis, which we in Vermont have opted to have be separate aspects of our school reopening conversation. So as De Deputy Secretary will has probably explained to you, like there's guidance about hybrid or educational models, there's guidance about social emotional learning. The, the health guidance itself contained itself with it in its lane, as we said. And so we didn't address teacher or parental choice by on purpose because it's addressed elsewhere. So, so we got a 10 out of 12 with an asterisk, which to me is a 12 out of 12. So please know that we are very, uh, this plan had all the right people in it and it has been well regarded when reviewed independently. So I'm I'm just super proud of it, and I I wanted to make sure you I'm sure you hear a lot of uh, dissent, but in terms of the and I do also echo what Deputy Secretary said, which is we have too much uh, we just really love the way our school districts function in their uniqueness, and to say this is the plan and everybody has to do exactly what that didn't make any sense. And, and when people started wishing for it, it didn't make sense to me as the leader of the task force. So stop there. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. I think um, it does make sense to have clear uh, public health information and then that can help guide uh, local decisions. And that's what I'm hearing you say, both of you, okay. Uh, one one last question, and it's a, a comment and a question, and that is, as you may or may not know, one of my concerns has always been having adequate uh, nurses uh, in school, school nurses, and the adequacy has, uh, for me, has always been very, uh, there's been a shortcoming in that area. To say that you've increased the number of public health nurses from four to eight is reassuring, but uh, are we seeing uh, adequate um, healthcare personnel in our schools? Are we seeing nurses available to do the testing and the um, temperature measuring uh, on a daily basis? I know that the nurse doesn't have to be there to take the te temperature in the morning, but having a nurse available for faculty and, and children does seem important during the day. Can either or both of you comment on, on that? Sure. I'll start by saying, um, maybe some of you know, I wrote the national policy statement for the American Academy of Pediatrics on the role of school nurses. So we are very clear you need a nurse in every building from a health perspective. And Vermont gets uh, part of the way there, it, and it does better than most states. But we don't have a nurse in every building. That being said, almost every school district commits to a nurse in every building and then has trouble with the workforce. It's actually hard to find folks to do the work. So when you hear there isn't a nurse in a school, don't, I don't want folks to assume it's because it wasn't budgeted or it wasn't part of the mission or the wish. Sometimes it's a workforce. 
Okay. And that being said, because we know that there's not always enough nurses in any part of healthcare, we created a school nurse leader model years ago. I feel like maybe we've talked to this committee about it, but it, we're really proud of it. And it's the idea that it, you, you put your very, very best, amazing, well-trained school nurse at the administrative table to look at the schools in your district and say, gosh, I'm worried about this small elementary school because there's two kids with diabetes and we really need to adequately stop that school. And you make those decisions in the summer based on leadership. So that system has helped us enormously in COVID that we have school nurse leaders who are very uh, in close contact with their school superintendents and principals. That being said, uh, we need more. We have had some op options to use the Medical Reserve Corps, which has turned out to be a little problematic from a licensure mm -hmm. perspective, but we are using the Medical Reserve Corps folks with some independent schools that don't have nurses. And also for the temp checks, as you noted, those do not have to be health professionals. Uh, in fact, most schools are not using health professionals because we like to save that expertise for the kids that are sick or need to be excluded or some of the clinical decision making. So in all, with this being my whole career passion, I'm feeling another silver lining of COVID is the leadership of school nurses uh, and that there are tighter connections with school administrators because no one thought or tried to open schools without their school nurses at their hip. So I'm feeling actually quite hopeful. I'm interested to see what Deputy Secretary thinks. Yeah, and I had raised my hand um, <laughs> just to, to not be rude and jump in. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that Dr. Holmes said. I do, um, and I think, um, Dr. Holmes, I would ask for a little clarification um, on this because of course you are the expert on this area. One of the things that I, I think about though is that we sometimes confuse a full-time position with, um, with you know, a nurse being in the building. And so my understanding, for instance, is that all of our districts have a nurse, a, pretty much a full-time nurse. It might be though that the nurse is not, that, that every school does not have a full-time nurse. And what that would look like, my understanding is in a situation where there were a case detected is, there would be a nurse readily available who would who would zoom over to that school even if they weren't there that day and would would yeah. um, start you know doing the contact tracing and and well doing the liaising with the Department of Health. So I I, I have noticed that folks um, it, when I've talked with folks kind of in the field they were conflating that full time piece which we all know is the best model we all want a full time nurse in every school. But if there isn't a full-time nurse, that doesn't mean there's no nurse available. Right. And sometimes right. I think that that gets conflated a little. So that's all I wanted to add, Brina, if you wanted to maybe chat about that a little more, because again, this is your area and you know more about that staffing piece than I do. No, that's correct. I think, I think adequately staffing is really the school nurse leader's role. And um, I, I do think some schools need more nursing support than others based on the needs of their students. I, but, and also Utopia is a school nurse and full-time in every school. So it's a fun, um, you know, yes and conversation because I, I actually think people are doing, the school leadership really gets it and they get it even more now and it's, it's actually kind of heartening. The other thing I'm so excited about is what we call team-based care which it's always been best for students and parents if pediatricians and school nurses are in constant contact about kids. And some schools do this beautifully. Some school nurses meet you know, weekly with care coordinators and medical homes. And we're, we're uh, elevating those models to share with other communities to say, this is how you're gonna get kids back to school who have symptoms and they don't have COVID or you know, recovering from COVID, whatever's ahead, I know for sure needs a team. and. Uh, special educators need to be on that team. And to me, it's it's a great model that we're going to just elevate because of a pandemic, which and then we're never going back. That's the beauty of some of the gifts, which is, again, strength based, just trying to stay positive. I'm so sorry I have to go at 1130 and it's no, 1132. We're, 
we, we've gone over oh, you're just at time a bit. Too. Great. I, I'm going to let um, Senator McCormick a ask his question, and then we'll Thanks. we're going to switch gears. So, uh, Thanks. thank you. Very very briefly, I want to thank you for the good work you've done. I have argued for a higher level of caution than we've actually exercised, and on the question of whether or not to open the schools, uh, as this is not the first time my colleagues have not found my efforts at persuasion to be persuasive. And that train has left the station and the schools are open. So that being the case, the best I or anyone else can hope for is that if we're gonna do it, that, that we do it safely. And I think you're probably you're, you're doing it as well as it can be done. So thank you for your good work. Let me ask you this. Do you think it's time to reopen the uh, legislature in the state house? using the same uh, safety protocols? Well, no, there's an interesting question. Uh, I guess I would need to know more about how well you <laughs> feel you're functioning. No, honestly, because this gets asked a lot. The governor gets asked this a lot at press conferences. Why are you opening schools, but, but uh, this agency of human services is still remote, right? And the answer is that we have figured out a way to do our job and if we keep our community safer, the schools are going to be safer. Do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? So if you guys feel, if you all feel that you have achieved a high level of function in Zoom, uh, then it probably is, it keeps the community safer if there's less humans getting together. Yeah. Because I, we I want our schools to do, you know, it's the same with healthcare and schools. People need to do these things in person. And so the rest of us, it's, that's just one person's opinion, though. Please don't take that as any official. No, I, I'll I, ask Dr. Levine. As I say, at, at this point, that train has left the station, and, and I hope we do it well. I hope the reopening of the schools is successful. I would take no pleasure in saying I told you so. I really, And I mean that sincerely. I think you're doing a, a, as good a job as can, can be done. Thanks. So, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. I know that's a question you've been uh, uh, asking, or at least you're, a position you've been supporting for a while. And uh, I'm sure that I know that that discussion is going on in various uh, legislative committees. So we will, we, I'm sure we'll return to that one. Yep. Um, I want to switch gears um, unless there are other questions for Dr. Holmes or Deputy Secretary Boucher. All right. Thank you. Thank you both for being Thank here. Thank you this all. Has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. So um, I see that Katie is here, and I also see that Ruby uh, Baker is here, and those represent two different issues. 8611, which we have not gotten to, but uh, we're, we definitely have on our agenda for tomorrow. So we will be spending some time on that. I'm going to elevate that to uh, number one for us. I do have um, a question for Katie uh, going back to the public safety mental health issue. Um, and Katie, I don't know whether or not uh, an MOU has been, uh, a draft MOU has been shared at any point with uh, legislative committees, the, the uh, healthcare committee in the house. Uh, I'm not sure that I've personally seen it, but I can check their website to see if they have that posted. Yeah, I haven't done that yet either. Um, uh, what I'm gonna suggest to the committee is, I mean, there was a lot of questions that were raised as we heard testimony uh, about how to move forward on this, my my concerns um, really are. I I really am concerned about having the public safety become a, a separate parallel mental health uh, organization, and and not wanting that to to run rampant uh, and to allow for the Department of Health and the DAs to be uh, have the oversight necessary so that we, we know that this is done appropriately. Um, I don't know, Katie, if there's anything that you can offer at this point as to the steps that are going on 
in the house and particular with respect to the budget? I haven't looked at that yet. Sure. Um, the House Committee has met several times on this issue, most recently yesterday, but I think they've met at least two other times. And they're meeting uh, in a few minutes again to have some committee instruction. And after today's meeting, I'll probably have more of a sense of what direction they're going in. Okay, I think that's helpful. I think we'll, we're, uh, by virtue of the timing that we're in, uh, we're gonna have to hold off and see what their recommendations are. And then we'll, um, we'll be in a responsive position, but we, we need to do that. So we'll, I think we'll take it up uh, this will be part of the budget. Is that your sense? We're not going to get a bill on this. My sense is that it will be part of the budget, yes. Yeah, so that'll give us an opportunity next week to go through the budget and then uh, to consider what policy recommendations are being made. Okay, just uh, thank you for keeping us up to date any way you can. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. Committee questions for Katie on this one? Okay, we're good. Uh, again, review the testimony that the, as much as you can, I know there's a lot, um, but at least look at their witness uh, list and maybe some of the testimony that's been submitted would be helpful. All right, I want to move over uh, to uh, first, is there, a, is this anyone wish to make a motion on H607, which is the nurse and um, primary care workforce bill. I, the bill will be going to appropriations. There's no question about it. But I think we heard yesterday that um, the, the money is there. There's a, a million dollars more or less being appropriated for um, scholarships for nurses and for um, medical students uh, with an incentive of going into primary care with a payback of time, two years per year of support. Um, uh, the other money has not been spent on uh, mental health. And I think if we let it sit there too long, it's not gonna be spent on anything. Uh, my, my thinking is we did make a recommendation about having more mental health counselors supported and incentivized. I think we have a we have an actionable proposal in the form of H six O seven, and I would um, uh, consider it tomorrow having a a proposal or a motion to move that bill. The only I think the only outstanding question is whether or not naturopathic is included in the initial uh, definition. Certainly, it can't be in the in the um, award because we don't have a naturopathic uh, school in our state. So, so tomorrow, okay with that one, Senator Cummings? No touch screen on this computer. I thought the naturopaths wanted to be on the advisory board. That's it, thank you, yeah. Okay. My, yeah, brain cramp. Uh, so it would be on the oh, advisory board. My brain board. is very cramped at the moment. So I know, we all are. So listen, consider that. And if you want to have that included, let me know or let Jen, uh, let me know and copy Jen on that. Uh, and it would, it has to be a committee decision to include them on the advisory board. That's for strategic planning going, you know, so it may be useful to have that. Okay. And tomorrow uh, we have 607 and 611 and 795 up for discussion. On 611, there we are. And Ruby, you're here. Um, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you for, for joining us again. I, actually, I wanna ask you uh, if you have any recommendations for improvements to the bill as it's come to us from the house. Um, the recommendations that I primarily have, you have in testimony in written form, which might make your life a little easier, um, but I can go back over sort of the highlights if that helps. 
Can you do that for just in just a few minutes, and that'll that'll refresh our our uh, memories. <laughs> Yeah, the, the sort of primary recommendations that, um, that I gave in testimony were about reintroducing language to, um, to put a funding mechanism in rather than just a rate study. We, we know that home and community-based services are underfunded. This is, we don't need a study to tell us that. And, um, the original language in the bill um, ha was was about creating that mechanism now and to um, I think this committee has made the point several times uh, about the opposing benefits of studies versus making a difference right now and especially during COVID these home and community based services are the reason that people are able to stay in their homes in a safe environment and still get the support that they need. And we need to we need to support those services. We've seen it with adult days. Some of them have had to close. We've seen um, our senior centers and all of our service providers really are struggling to make ends meet and to deliver those services. And they're doing a phenomenal job. So I think they, they deserve that support. Um, the other recommendation that I made, and it and it isn't a specific language recommendation, but really something for discussion and thought with this committee, so this might be a good moment to just touch on it, is how are we including senior centers in this system? Um, you heard testimony from Deanna last week, and I would just say that um, one of the points that I've heard made specifically about home-delivered meals is that um, home delivered meals or Meals on Wheels is one of the only recommendations that um, that someone might get when they are leaving the hospital uh, in terms of like rehabilitation and recovery. It's one of the only recommendations that actually isn't billable under insurance. And um, so I guess the recognition there is that our doctors, our primary care providers, all recognize that this is part of healthcare and nutrition is part of healthcare and wellness and long term survival of humans. So, um, where that recognition falls in, in this bill is, um, I, in my personal opinion, we could talk about that a little further and, and how vital and integral to our health and wellness system senior centers are not just to our social interaction and how how older adults have fun in the community. It's really part of the healthcare system. So um, that's a discussion that, that I think deserves a little more consideration. And then lastly is our, our safety and protections. Um, I sit on the Adult Protective Services Subcommittee and COVE was part of the, um, the lawsuit there a while ago. And I just think that um, putting all of our eggs in the APS basket is foolish. Not all older adults are vulnerable. Uh, the statutory definition there is very narrow. It's an old statute. And so what is a more comprehensive approach to safety for older adults? And what does coordination with law enforcement and mental health, and I heard some of the testimony this morning about that as well, um, how does that spread over into older adults? So, you know, that's my large nutshell. So you brought to us some very large nuts <laughs> to crack. Um, and I think they're all really, the, each one of your suggestions is um, admirable and, and exciting for us to think about. Um, so given the time that we have committee, uh, our goal is to make sure that we can pass a bill that then the house is going to concur. And I will, I'll run some of the ideas that might gener be generated out of what you are saying. I think the Meals on Wheels piece is really important and ensuring that seniors have access to adequate food, especially when they're coming out of the hospital. Um, we, we know how difficult that is. So even when they're going home and they have someone at home, they don't always have the care and the nutrition that they need. I think um, senior Senator, centers. Uh, yes, ma'am. 
Sorry. Go ahead. Um, no. Uh, Go. Last year, there was, I believe, a proposal to um, to create a mechanism for billing Meals on Wheels to insurance. You might want to talk with um, Representative Noise about that. I think. Yes, I I get that. I know that. And uh, but here here's where we are. We're not at a place where we can take up something that is going to require testimony. Uh, significant testimony. I think that is a really good bill for us to consider going forward, just as I think adding uh, senior centers into the uh, system of care is a really good issue for us to take up. And how do we do that? That's important. Uh, the beauty of um, the bill that we have in front of us is it establishes the principles upon which we can build. You, it's like putting in greenhouse gas reduction goals. And then the next thing you do is you pass some bill that actually gets you there. Um, so, but I'm, I'm hearing you. Um, committee thoughts about um, some of the directions that uh, Ruby Baker has uh, suggested. Any comments? Okay, uh, here's my suggestion read through H611. I know you're doing that already for tomorrow. I, I would like for us, if there is language that we can add that would project um, additional policies in, in the areas that Ruby has brought up, because I think they're, they're important ones. Um, maybe there's some language we can add. Maybe there's uh, an amendment we can add related to any one of these, but we will be going through the second half of the bill tomorrow. We got to the end of the older Vermonters uh, information yesterday. And then tomorrow we'll go through the rest of the bill and we'll try to do some markup on that bill. That's tomorrow after we've uh, had our joint meeting with um, DFR. And then we'll be also looking at 607. So any, any, um, Amendments that you'd like to place on 607, please bring those in as well, including the one we mentioned on naturopathic. And then we'll look at the amendment H795. That will probably be the last bill that we deal with. And that may not be until you know, next week. But we wanna try to complete our work on these bills. We're just getting to a place where we have an understanding of what's there and what's not there. And that's probably important. Questions. I sent a memo out to you from DFR that helps explain what we're discussing tomorrow with House Health Care. Uh, I know we have an hour and 15 minutes scheduled for that discussion. I'm hoping we can go through it um, efficiently. Okay. Um, Representative Wood, I think we've gotten to a place of closure. Uh, we'll be taking up 611 tomorrow as well as um, 607 and trying to finish our work on those two bills. Committee comments, suggestions? need for therapy at this point after this day we've been through a lot the ringer has gotten us <laughs> talk about mental health counseling here Indeed. we are <laughs> <laughs> some days this committee is depressing to say don't don't be depressed i'm, I'm <laughs> energized there's so much we can do think about all the problems we can solve going forward <laughs> that's the good news all right. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to give us uh, nine minutes off. We deserve it after today. And uh, Ruby, thank you again for being with us and, and bringing your uh, comments again. Greatly appreciated. My pleasure. So, committee, I'll see you at one o'clock. Uh, 967 has been approved by rules, so that will be on notice today. And I don't know whether we're going to take it up or not, but I'll be ready to offer comments on it. All right. Thank you all, take care. Nellie, we can leave. Thanks.